been pointing out to myself. Six o'clock. He's turning into Capitola now. Go ahead. He says start with him. Six o'clock, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the SoCal Creek Water District for March 5th. Um, Roll call will show that un, is, uh, Director Christensen thought she might be away in teleconferencing, but she's here in person. And at this moment, we're still missing Director Jaffe. Um, the first item on tonight's agenda with no public hearing would be the consent agenda. So any directors have any things they would like removed from consent? No. Okay, any members of the public? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I would like to pull item number 3.1, the approval of the minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to just, the uh, 3.4, a couple of comments on that. 3.4? Yes. So, the rest are up for grabs. I approve. I m move that we do the rest of the consent agenda. I'll second. Three, two, three, 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 five, and three, six. I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries. So we'll go to item 3.1, um, which a member of the public has asked to, to has bring forward. 3.1? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. The minutes. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I want to uh, point out that the, um, how it's recorded that the different directors voted is not accurate. Uh, Director Lather did not abstain. Oh, I did. You were silent. And then afterwards, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you were silent, and then afterwards during public comment, I asked you how you voted, and I had noticed, I had observed that you were silent during the vote. So then there was some brief discussion after that item in during public comment, but um, I need to have it clear that Director Lather did not abstain from voting. She was silent. And I believe that there are different legal ramifications of that. Perhaps Mr. Basso can um, enlighten us, but um, that needs to be corrected. I also, um, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Anyone else? I don't, I don't know the distinction. I do not either. Parliamentary procedure does not have an entry for didn't respond. That's. <coughs> I don't know, Mr. Brasso. Do you happen to know? I don't whether or not. And parliamentary procedure does not have any entry for you didn't respond. There's a there's yes, no, and abstain. Okay, no more. So it's discussion from the board. So as any move to approve or deal with the minutes then? Yes, I'll move to approve the minutes. I will second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Now I'm just trying to find, sorry, I'm having trouble finding. Page 69. 69. Thank you. I don't know why. There's just so many visuals. I'm losing it in there. Okay. I always have some. Oh, it was after the schedule. That's why. Okay. Sorry about that. So on what's on tab? Um, so on the first page, which is page 70 of the agenda packet, um, 
on the right-hand column under the article on Twin Lakes Church seawater intrusion prevention pilot. Um, I didn't know um, whether we might, it says collected soil samples and conducted and conducting a geophysical log. I didn't know whether just a little more explanation that they would be examining the cores and analyzing to help guide, you know, the recharge or is that good enough? You like it? That's inaccurate. A geologic log is where you put a wire down the, the well and you measure, cons you know. But we're also going to look at the cores. Yeah, but that's that. not, okay. you can just take this out and put something else okay. in, sure. But okay. Right, I understand. Okay. okay. Um, it was just a suggestion maybe we explain that we are going to analyze the suitability of the of the geology for for recharge and water quality That's good. just because it was something we were looking at yeah I mean yeah I, I mean that's all I thought that might be of more interest and then on the um, about the metering system upgrade um, I just wondered if um, that might maybe should just a thought whether that should be the first article because it saves you know 28 million gallons of water that was the only other possible thought I don't know what anyone else thinks fine with me it's uh, pretty I, d I do know that um, the finance and customer service was very interested in having the billing article so we could do the billing and the, the um, metering system on the front if the board desires that Maybe, because I just, I just think that's a really cool thing for people to understand. And I don't know if there's a picture of, like it has that kind of picture of how it works, but I don't know if there's any way there's a little picture of the interface that people will have as an app, you know? Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Because I um, think that's gonna be very different for people to be able to check their water use and, and, um, mm -hmm. s and really adjust and save water, so. Anyway, we try to give a little indication of that with the iPad thing there, a phone on its side. Yeah, I just I don't know what the real harmony thing will look like, but those are just my suggestions. You can take them or leave them. Okay, and I don't think there's anything else. Anybody else have anything on that? Item? Okay, all right. So then we will move on as soon as I can get my agenda to come up. There we go. Okay, so now it's time for oral communications, which should be on items not on tonight's agenda. My name is Tom Stumbaugh. I'm from residence of uh, resident of Aptos. Uh, I do not think that this water district should under any circumstances be allowed to contaminate the aquifer with sewage. We do not own the aquifer. We in the, within the boundaries of this district do not own that aquifer and we are not the only ones who use it. If we truly had a government of, by, and for the people, it's quite possible that you would be required to get written permission from 50% plus one of all the people who rely on this aquifer for their water. And you know very well that that would never happen. Please set <coughs> the Pure Water SoCal System project <coughs> on hold and work on other solutions until it is known that you can remove all the contaminants from sewer water or it becomes absolutely necessary to do it. 
We don't need to do it right now because as I understand, there is plenty of water available to go about this recharging of our aquifer <coughs> without the sewer water project. Now, um, we had government of, for, and by the people, it would be better than this because this is of, by, or of the people, by the rich and powerful, and for the rich and powerful. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Tom inspired me. <laughs> um, I'm a resident of Aptos, and I depend on the Prisma Aquifer, too. I'm not a district customer, but many people who depend on the Prisma Aquifer for their, wa for their water are not district customers. So I um, have filed this legal action, and I will speak a bit more later in the agenda about it um, during clo before closed session. But today I tried to appeal to the court for a temporary restraining order because I see that this district has lost sight of the people. This district has lost sight of the bigger picture. And in the zeal to get the grants, you've lost sight of the people who have elected you and the people who also depend on the Prisma Aquifer for safe water. So um, I would like to submit this to, um, for the record and hope that it will be included in the next uh, board packet so that people can see my plea for um, reason and it, sadly, uh, Judge Gallagher, who had worked for Mr. Basso and done work for the district for nine years, denied the temporary restraining order. But um, what remains to be seen is how, uh, what legal action will come uh, further down the line regarding this. And I hope that uh, the water is safe and that you will reconsider what your actions are here tonight in terms of many things and the people that elected you. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Terry Maxwell, and I am a rate paying customer of the Soquel Creek Water District. And I wanted years ago to be enthusiastic about the performance of your board of directors here and your staff. I can't be anything but critical, informed, legitimately so. Not long ago at a meeting Ms. Steinbrenner arranged in Aptos for customers of long standing, a woman who'd been 40 year resident of Aptos and helped what your, some of your board members get elected. She mentioned 25 years ago she helped Bruce get elected. And she used the term being very well informed lady in her 80s or so, but very smart and informed. And she said you have demonstrated nothing referring to the entire board and your staff but negligence. Her word negligence. Negligence toward the water negligence toward the aquifer, negligence toward your responsibilities to your customers, negligence towards how you manage the money of other people. It is a balming, just a ghastly awful. <sighs> Forty years of negligence by the members of this Soquel Creek Water Board of Directors is demonstrated. And the poop to scoop Water is nothing but another outrage of asking uh, 15,000 water customers to incur 100 to $150 million worth of bond debt to satisfy the scheme, to satisfy most clearly the people who will sell the bonds, once again, probably Goldman Sachs, San Francisco affiliates, and maybe some other insiders in the county and the construction people involved. And I'm not sure about whether I can ex excuse any of you for your negligence and failure to protect the public purse, your failure to protect your customers and their interests, and your failure to protect the water resources. Forty continuous years of negligence. And I include Mr. DeFore there in those committee negligence. And I don't say things I haven't seen boxes of evidence for. And speaking of that, I'll be requesting more evidence from you on public records requests and maybe subpoenas. And I darn well expect your attorney to be honest. <laughs> 
in complying. No more games. And speaking of that, his former law partner for 10 years and a fellow who worked for you guys, get, made a lot of money getting paid by the prior board members here, Judge Gallagher. I was appalled when Gallagher admitted he had a conflict of interest with Mr. Basso that goes back more than a decade, and Basso helped him get elected to the court. By every question of judicial ethics, Judge Gallagher should have recused himself. Mr. Basso should have moved for that recusal, and you should move for that recusal. And it's another example of the continuous corruption, dishonesty, mismanagement, and theft from the taxpayers, citizens, voters, and water customers in this county. You should all be embarrassed. You should all be replaced with a consolidation of Santa Cruz and the other districts here. The sooner that comes about, the better. And water rates could be one half of what they are. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Your time is up. Anyone else? Good evening. Fox Sloan, Soquel Hills, and I'm a rate payer. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but wow, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> um, John Gallagher, I have had um, seen him in action, and I am a system-induced trauma survivor of other government agencies here in the People's Republic of Santa Cruz County. Um, John Gallagher has like zero um, integrity as part of the judiciary from my experience and having him sit in the um, CPS dependency court and selling children from families to inappropriate strangers and that's where I come in as a child and family rights advocate and to think that this poo poo plant is going to be poisoning children in the future is appalling and you should be ashamed of yourself. You either don't have children or the children you have you really don't care about. I've studied the alternatives that they have um, presented and they're all viable. With all this rain going out into the ocean, um, it's a shame. It could have been saved. This aquifer could have been recharged with rainwater, not poo poo water. And I'm also, um, my ancestors are of the seventh generation tribes. We don't think today, and only today, and maybe tomorrow, we think seven generations down the line. I am responsible today for my great, 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 great grandchildren, and I hope you are too. So think of the children. Don't poison them with this poo poo water. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Looks like no one else. So, any any board members looking for oral communications? Yes, sir. Um, finally, today we have reached 100% of normal for this occasion. So, we're supposed to get some more rain tonight. So, we may actually go over normal slightly, which is good news because it was looking pretty dry there for a while. Um, I saw an interesting thing on one of the news services that uh, you you may have heard the governor is kind of wanting to see desal come back. And the truth is that in the last four years, all eight of the desal proposals have made no progress. That shows some of the changes that have been made such that uh, you know, desal basically is a pretty unviable uh, system now. Um, I went to the Water Commission last night, and uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. They were, it was their quarterly review, so they were talking about, you know, the, uh, the, plant, the transfer that we have going on right now and one of the concerns was about, uh, you know, are they going to actually be able to get good data? And it's going to be a challenge because we've had to turn our system down and up and down and up and down, which means our wells have been going up and down, up and down. So, you know, being able to get clear signals out of that with all that noise in the background is going to be a real challenge. And uh, in the future, that could be, you know, like another thing that we have to be worrying about. Uh, interestingly enough, they didn't talk about, uh, you know, the uh, proposal to. Uh, to give us water at the right time, so that was unfortunate. And uh, they're having a meeting with the Wasac folks in July, sorry, not July, uh, April, and then a city council meeting. Okay, anyone else? All right, then we will move on. Uh, next item of business is, we have no reports, so we'll move on to administrative business and item 6.1, which is the um, 
Well, conditional and unconditional will serve. Okay, good evening. Um, we have three con uh, will serves on uh, before the board tonight. Um, I can answer any questions. There are uh, maybe 6.1.2 could use some further explanation. That is where an, a change of use is gonna occur. And the prior use was a dry cleaner that had a much higher uh, water use than what's proposed to be replacing it. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from board members? I do, I have a question. So there's been an increase in will serves since we went to the two step process correct or is that not no correct? that's actually not correct there's been a processing of all of the projects that were on the wait list we gave them an opportunity to go ahead and purchase or reapply um, as far as new applicants that weren't on the wait list we've maybe seen four or five in the last I don't know a couple months so most of the ones that have been brought to you were people that were on the wait list right so it's not new applications but Will serves have, because they're on the wait list, they weren't getting a will serve and now they've gotten it. Yeah. So it might be semantics, but okay. there are more will serves now. So my question is on the timing of, you know, like tonight there's one for a, for a motel, 19 rooms plus a manager's office, you know, uh, quarters or, and so how long typically do these things take to, to get through the, the planning process. Sure, we included um, as attachment three of the will serve item, um, some information on that. We went back and took a look at um, projects and we found that for single family homes and ADUs is almost three years from the date that they applied to the date that we closed out the project, meaning they got their meter. So the demand would come after like 2.8 years. Um, for commercial projects, it's generally much longer and they're kind of all across the board in terms of timing. I mean, you have Aptos Village, which has taken many years um, and we had the offsets already in place before that's even coming online. So we've been saving all of that water for probably, you know, 10 years now, so. Does that answer that question? Yeah, there's okay. just a concern with with the timing of the AMI and when that's sure. going to come Sure, and I did want to kind of point out a couple other things on that attachment. So you can see that there's um, basically two pie charts. Yeah. The first is where we thought we would be in terms of offset balance after we processed all of the applicants that were on the wait list. We thought we were going to have about 50 acre feet left. Um, and coming back to you when it gets down around 25 acre feet. Instead, we, we sold about 10 acre feet less than we expected, so our balance is, is closer to 60 acre feet or was after we worked through all those applicants. Um, the green in that pie chart on the right shows that um, 27 acre feet's been sold. Six of that was a uh, deficit for older projects and the other 21 acre feet was is for all of the new people and um, most of those projects now will not be coming online for at least two years and so um, we're not you know we're not going to be seeing their demand for a couple of years and the AMI project is getting underway and once we get the first base station and repeater in and then those um, registers and, and new meters within that first kind of pilot test area, we're gonna start seeing savings pretty immediately because yeah. staff is gonna be looking at those every day and assessing the leaks and following up on the leaks based on the severity. So we're gonna be seeing early water savings with AMI. It's not gonna be that we have to wait until the whole AMI project is complete in two years to start recognizing any savings. It's gonna be incremental as we start installing the system. And you'll update us on the, the yeah. savings? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, can I just, is, wasn't it about this first pilot area? Is it like about a 
fifth of our district, something like it's that? It's about a quarter. Quarter. Yeah. Right. All right. A couple questions? thousand services. Okay. Other questions? Uh, okay. Members of the public? Tom Stumbaugh, Aptos. Our aquifer, as you have written, has been seriously overdrafted for years, many years. Yet, it doesn't seem to slow this board down in granting new connections to the system. You have some new ones on this page right here, and you have some new ones on every page when we come to these meetings. You have new connections to grant. So I, I don't understand. It's just you have, con you have the power to control the population growth here, but you just keep right on issuing new permits. When we went and tried to figure out why you gave so many water offset credits to the Aptos Village project, they claimed 80 toilets and 40 urinals at Cabrillo College, and they produced proof that consisted of one sheet that was signed off by a, pro a, a, a project foreman. Yet, you can go and, and, and uh, replace one toilet and that will produce a record of four pages, up to four pages of information about who, what, where, when, and why, and how much. And one page from the uh, village project people at both Cabrillo and here, the water district in your office down there, one page to prove 80 toilets and 40 urinals. It's really surprising, and it makes me a little uh, confused as to how to understand this whole mess. Thank you. Next. Good evening, Becky Steinbrenner. I have a question about um, item 6.1.3, the 19-unit hotel with manager's apartment. Um, it's not clear um, on the information on the back what size um, service connection this would have. And um, my other question is, would it have a master meter or would there be sub-meters? Um, I'd like some information on that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Maxwell, again, a customer. I'm not confused. I know exactly the flim flam that's going on. It's gone on here for 40 years and it went on regarding SoCal Creek, the SoCal, the Aptos Village. Good God, how can you all and your staff be so dishonest, Mr. Dufour, about the realities of the, of the Aptos Village project? How can you be so dishonest about the aquifer depletions? How can you cave into the developers like Swenson? Cave in, how can you give away the resources of this water district so irresponsibly and negligently? Again and again. And the 19 unit, how in the hell can you even contemplate approving 19 more hotel rooms with bathrooms, presumably, that will use water by people who don't care if they waste a lot while they're here? How can you, for an instant, even consider this application? And why didn't you reject it promptly, consistent with your obligations to protect the water aquifer, to protect the interests of all of your customers and citizens here, and the resources of the limited depleting aquifer that's depleted because of the negligence of this Water Creek District and its board of directors and its senior staff for decades. This is another piece of irresponsibility. I asked you, each of you, address by what justification you could possibly, or your staff, for a minute, consider adding 19 more hotel units to deplete the water resources here. Mr. DeFore, please answer that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, board discussion. Yeah. <laughs> no? I'm, no. I'm not going to engage. I, I recommend that all those who have uh, 
talked, look at our water demand offset pro program, and then uh, after looking at that, um, I'm sure you'll come back and talk again. Okay. Any other thoughts, motions? I just sort of add too, it, keep, it keeps coming back to the Aptos Village, but you know, Aptos Village, those very toilets that you speak of that are so undocumented, contributed 20% of the decline in water use from 2003 down to, to the present. They, those offset, this offset program contributed to the fact that we have, we're, we're, we have the amount of water that we were expected to use at this time, and we have time to figure out the community water plan. So all of this, those efforts that you say are not documented, Cabrillo College is, knows because they are using far less water now than they did. Anyway, we all we all know we're trying to do our best, and for so yeah, we have to. Repeat we're this not going to have everybody agree with us all the meeting, time. Meeting though, we have to repeat this every meeting, just like you guys come every meeting. Yeah, but we need to really emphasize that every application that is submitted is designed. They are required to save two hundred percent of the water that they would have been using. Exactly. In, in a regular house. So that's yeah, the idea no, of the water demand. Okay, comments. no, we're not going to. No, no more. Hotel no more. No more. No more. Okay. So, um, what's your pleasure, board? Any motions? Okay. Yeah, I'll move. I'll move to approve all three. Okay. Second. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. And this is once again, I'm clarifying because you're worried about the AMI not coming on in time. Okay, despite the staff's explanation. Okay, well, we'll talk about that again coming up, I think, in April. So I think that's coming up. All right, next item is uh, Mid County Groundwater Agency modeling presentation. So I think yeah, we're going to turn Yeah, I'm going to introduce uh, Cameron Tana from uh, Montgomery and Associates. He's here tonight to present basically what uh, was presented the other night to the Mid County Groundwater Agency. Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee. Uh, and then plus some of the work that's been done before that. So basically two things. One are the metrics that are being used to define groundwater sustainability. And there's five or six of those and he'll go to th through those with really one or two being the primary ones. And then the modeling that was done subsequent, uh, subsequently to the approval of the EIR for Pure Water SoCal the MGA asked um, wh what else, how could it be enhanced within the confines of the EIR to uh, even better protect against seawater intrusion. And that's important to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency because they've included uh, the Pure Water Soquel project in their, uh, they voted to include that in their groundwater sustainability plan along with other projects, but it's one of their primary projects. So they, with great interest, want to see how it can be uh, enhanced, so to speak. Um, Cameron? Just do his presentation. Yeah, so we'll, um, yeah, do we have it on this one, Emma, the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah, we got it on your screen. So do you want us to do it for you, Cameron? Run it? Might be easier. Whichever way is easiest. Yeah, because it's kind of down at the lower level. Just tell us to click it. Okay. I think you're up. So, okay. I'll, I'll turn you up. so give us just a second. We'll is this PowerPoint now? Uh, probably. Melanie. No, that's. Uh, oh, I have it. That's oh, it's me. Okay. Okay. All right, so we got it over here. So let's okay. switch screen. Um, Mm-hmm. Well, it's good to be back in front of this, this board. Um, so the outline of my talk as my presentation as, as Ron previewed is the first uh, describe uh, one of the main aspects of defining sustainability for the groundwater sustainability plan and focusing on the major, the, ma the principal sustainable in the sustainability indicator uh, for the GSP and that's seawater intrusion. So the packet does include as attachment one for this item, uh, proposed draft seawater intrusion minimum thresholds, which define sustainability around seawater intrusion for the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin. 
I will descri also describe information from a proposed approach for measurable objectives, which uh, are goals for the basin that was presented at the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee for the Mid-County Groundwater Agency uh, in September 26, 2018. So if you're interested in that information, it's part of that packet. And then I will basically repeat uh, presentation I gave last Wednesday to the GSP Advisory Committee about uh, groundwater modeling of Pure Water Soquel that has uh, some enhancements that we are looking at uh, as part of the GSP process. That's attachment two, uh, that presentation which I will go over is attachment two in the packet. Next please. So just to review broadly, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, SIGMA, the def definition of sustainability is based off of the aquifer condition. So to be sustainable, you want to avoid undesirable results. And if you avoid undesirable results, then that means you are using the aquifers within sus the basin within sustainable yield, and you're managing uh, the basin sustainably and meeting sustainability goal. This is very different from adjudication which is based off of pumping where a total safe yield is estimated and to be sustainable you just make sure you don't pump more than that amount so it's important to uh, understand what the undesirable results are and the locals for the basin help define what is undesirable for the basin next please so there are uh, six sustainability indicators in sigma uh, that requires sustainable management criteria. Uh, you can see the six there, and the criteria include a qualitative de description of su significant and unreasonable conditions, and then quantitative uh, information including minimum thresholds and undesirable results, which define uh, what is sustainable, and then measurable objectives, which are goals that provide uh, operational flexibility for, it for the users of the basin and interim milestones helped guide how you achieve those objectives. Next, please. So we'll focus on, I wanna go over specifically the cri criteria for seawater intrusion, uh, because seawater intrusion is the main sustainability indicator for this basin. The basin is listed by the state as being in critical, critically overdraft due to seawater intrusion. And so we'll go through these different proposed sustainable management criteria uh, for seawater intrusion. These have all been proposed, presented to the GSP Advisory Committee, but they have not been approved by uh, the MGA, the County Groundwater Agency Board. Next. So qualitatively, the current proposal for defining significant and unreasonable conditions for seawater intrusion, and these are basically the seawater intrusion conditions we want to avoid for the basin. And that proposal is to that seawater moving farther inland than has been observed in the past five years is significant and reasonable. The, the consensus of the GSP Advisor Committee is that uh, the committee does not want seawater intrusion to advance. And a five-year period is included because there is one instance of a previously intruded well that has had uh, become unintruded over the, the last five years, so we don't want that well to become uh, intruded again. Next. Proposed minimum threshold, so taking that qualitative description of what is considered significant, unreasonable, and bringing it into uh, a quantitative definition l where you can monitor for conditions and say, what is this significant or unreasonable or not? The Groundwater Sustainability Plan regulations put out by the state require for seawater intrusion that a chloride isocontour be defined for minimum thresholds. And this is basically a line on the map that uh, the, the <coughs> basin agency, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, doesn't want uh, chloride concentrations, salt concentrations to become higher inland of that line. And so, uh, that line is defined on this map here and based off and using a drinking water standard of 250 milligrams per liter. So the minimum threshold, what would be considered unsustainable is 250 grams per liter being detected inland of that line. And so where it exists, where seawater intrusion has been observed to date, uh, it's 
want to prevent that from going further inland, but the current condition is, is not considered unsustainable. This is uh, a slightly different from the policy goals that Soquel Creek Water District has set, especially in areas where seawater intrusion has not been detected. The district uh, selected uh, preventing seawater intrusion onto the coast, but th as far as monitoring and with the monitoring the wells that do exist, uh, it is effectively the same. Did, do you have a question, uh, yes, Vice President Daniels? Um, it seems like the line is pretty much with respect to monitoring wells, except for the seascape well, and I was wondering why that is treated differently than all the other points on that uh, contour. I mean, have we ever seen salt water in the seascape well? Why is that? So it's, it's based off of the monitoring well at the seascape well. Um, the, the deepest monitoring well at the seascape well location, SCA5A, does have a high concentrations in salt. So that's about 100 feet below, um, below the production well, and we've never seen it in the next monitoring well up, which is also below uh, the production well, and we haven't seen high concentrations in the production well, but uh, salt water is, uh, or high salt concentrations have been observed 100 feet below, so that, that's what it's based off of. Okay, so clearly there's a concern of upconing because that's what tends to happen. Mm -hmm. So do you, are you saying you don't, is the condition that there's no salt detected in that monitoring well below the seascape well or some or? Mm -hmm. So a significant and unreasonable result. And this is where the requirement for an isocontour uh, is potentially insufficient to, to meet your right. qualitative definition of what is significant and unreasonable or the NGA's right. uh, definition. And the NGA wants to prevent seawater intrusion from advancing. Advancing could mean up coning into shallower wells. And so for, uh, for defining undesirable results, uh, a well that isn't at that location, the shallower wells, uh, it should be included and preventing higher concentrations in those wells would be considered significant unreasonable. Before a map f to meet the plan requirements, this is uh, how so we're it's not proposing just, to it. So it's not just existence, yes or no, it's concentration uh, categorized as well then. So if the concentration in monitoring well increases, then that would be significant and unreasonable. Uh, above, uh, it would be considered undesirable based off of concentrations going above a, a threshold, which we will go over. But the threshold could be higher th than 250. If it's currently at 1,000, going hi even higher would be significant and unreasonable then. Uh, correct, yes, and, and I'll describe how we're treating that as well, yep. Or, or would the threshold be that next um, screen above that in the monitoring well if it gets over mm -hmm. 250, is that? Yeah, I think it would be both. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be both. We can okay. double check that, but I, I think it would be considered both and one, they would be treated differently because one has high concentrations and one has low concentrations. So, Cameron, this yes. line is, it applies to all layers of the peripheral aquifer. So, it, it, one it, line, but there's... It, it, it does, um, it, it does, but then once you, we get into the specific wells, we'll, we will treat the wells based off of the information at those specific wells. So if there are wells that are on this coastal side of, of this, such as the shallow wells at Seascape, it would be evaluated based off of the conditions for that well and that, that depth. So that would be mo multiple conditions at a single well location. Cor right. And then right. for example, some of those monitoring wells down in the, in the southeast of us, um, some of those are already halfway to sea water level, so yeah. then that, that would be, if it goes any higher, that would be a significant number as well. Yes, and we'll, we'll see how we're quantifying that uh, in a few, s maybe the, in a few okay. slides, yep. Next. Uh, next slide. Um, so 
So that's required to define a chloride isocontoured azimuth minimum threshold for seawater intrusion. For management purposes, uh, the, the regulations allow also to set groundwater level proxies for any of the sustainable sustainability indicators that aren't specifically groundwater levels. If you can prove a connection between your proxies and preventing the under undesirable results of significant and unreasonable conditions for the indicator like seawater intrusions. And uh, one thing the district did a number of years ago was, was to make that relationship and to estimate protective elevations to prevent seawater intrusion into the basin based off of the district's policy goals, which are similar in, in not wanting uh, seawater intrusion to, to advance. So. The proposed minimum thresholds for groundwater level proxies for seawater intrusions at the Soquel Creek Water District monitoring wells are the same as the protective elevations that Soquel Creek Water District has been managing to since, since that work was done. I want to I wanna thank Dr. Daniels for coming up with that methodology because it's, it's been extremely useful and it's simple. Uh, another question we have, is SCA 4 on the list, though, that's not in the MGA territory, so that that not uh, considered as a significant and reasonable by us? That that is the way we're treating it. Yeah, it's not in the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin. Right. right. So hopefully maybe Pajaro Valley might consider that. A, though they have never, they've never done any uh, remediation in that general area, so that would be tough for them to uh, It hasn't something they have done up to now, but yeah. they, they haven't had to operate under Sigma, Sigma as right. well, so right. we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, there, there have been no protective elevations established for the deeper units, the Prisma A and TU. If you recall from the SkyTem results, the SkyTem show salty water just offshore in those units as well as other units. Um, so we will be proposing uh, groundwater level proxies for those units as well. Uh, next, please. So th this uh, gets a little bit to the earlier questions about um, defining that uh, defining undesirable results at monitoring wells and in production wells are required to define representative monitoring points for looking for whether uh, conditions are significant and unreasonable, whether undesirable results are occurring. And so uh, have proposed this formulation for what would be undesirable. Yeah. And it's all based off chlor chloride concentrations um, and gets into more detail than just the isocontour where it's at specific wells. So intruded coastal monitoring wells, these intruded so it's already has high salt concentrations. We don't want those concentrations to go up over time. And so we'll be looking at the last five years maximum for defining what that threshold is. And if it goes over that threshold in two of four quarterly results, uh, quarterly samples, that would be considered undesirable. Uh, under Sigma, you are, are a permitted option of basically defining how many wells uh, thresholds would be ex exceeded, how many locations thresholds would be exceeded for it to be considered undesirable. Um, but for seawater intrusion, we are proposing that if for any well where these thresholds are exceeded, that would be considered undesirable. What's the definition of a well in this context? Like we have SCA1, mm -hmm. and we sometimes call that a well, but it's actually a cluster of wells with different depths. So yes. Are they each treated separately in this regard, or are they they, they are treated separately. Okay. So each each of those uh, separate completion intervals w are, are treated separately. Some of those are separate boreholes. Some of them are all in the same borehole but have separate intervals. Right. But if if it's interval and we and we think that it represents an interval separate from the other intervals, w those those are treated se as different wells. Uh, so for unintruded monitoring wells, it depends on how close to the coast. So consistent with the isocontour coastal unintruded monitoring wells, that threshold is 250 milligrams per liter and still using the two out of four quarterly samples. We're using, make, 
using two out of four to make sure it's just not one uh, one result that that isn't consistent with the condition over time at, and uh, whether it's uh, we just want to confirm that that's actually uh, an exceedance uh, of the threshold and going inland um, inland of the ISA contour that should be below 250 but we don't want that to get close to 250 based off of that so the proposed minimum threshold is 150 milligrams per liter at the unintruded inland monitoring wells and, and production wells uh, inland of, of the ISA contour. And when you refer to these as quarterly samples, for a lot of these wells, we have continuous monitoring. So how do you define, because a quarterly, we have three months lot worth of records. And I mean, do you pick out the worst or the best or the median or the mean? Or mm -hmm. So for water quality sample, they are actually uh, samples at specific times. And so there are a couple wells up I think where they sample as frequently as monthly, mm -hmm. but mostly it's it's quarterly or semi-annually or or at some wells annually. So these these are specific time sampling. Uh, what we are uh, monitoring continuously are groundwater levels, or what the district is monitoring continuously. Sure. Yeah. Uh, s and then for undesirable results, uh, where we're monitoring continuously. Uh, the groundwater level proxies are based off of a 10-year average uh, above the protective elevations at any well. And, and we've proposed, um, originally proposed five-year average. It, it's been moved to 10-year average. The idea behind using multi-year averages is that it is really the long-term uh, groundwater level that present, prevents seawater intrusion over the long term. So we want to represent that. Uh, with these groundwater level proxies. We also have the chloride concentration as uh, as minimum threshold, so they're tracking that as well. So we think it's appropriate to use this multi-year average. There has been, uh, there has been a request to reconsider the length here of 10 years, whether we should go back to five years, especially since the, the uh, the updates of the plan are required every five years. So there's been discussion about going back to to five-year average with this one. I think there's also this issue that you can have droughts, which could bring salt water in, and then it might get pushed back out. And the average might be okay, everything's fine, but you keep you know, bringing salt in, you know, every couple of years or three years or so. Exactly. That's a problem. So An average is not indicative not of the not condition. Yeah. So I know it's easier to do, but uh, I think it needs to be more stringent. Um, question about the 204 quarterly samples. Yes. From your experience, Cameron, have there been cases where you get a spike and then it goes back down? Is that what's motivating yes. the requirement? Yes, that, 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 has, that has occurred. Um, the other reason why uh, we don't want to considered something uh, we want to not just say one sample is is undesirable is that if that one sample then defines your basin as sustainable un unsustainable and then you potentially uh, subject the basin to state control so I think you do need some higher bar that it's just not one sample and that it's got to be repeatable uh, to to show that that the basin is, is unsustainable so, th so that's part of the thinking behind the advisory committee to make sure that something is repeatable because there is this concern like if, if you define something as very easily defined as unsustainable then then that could that could lead to state control of the basin doesn't the state allow you to rectify the situation and that's part of the plan for when you do get these on you know indicators that the this, the basin is becoming unsustainable doesn't the plan allow you to rectify it's not totally clear on, on that point but i think if you look over the the if you get the four quarterly samples you get that time over the year that does give you a chance to say whether <coughs> what give a full a full uh, accounting of the the situation for 
for the basin in, in your annual annual report and said this was a, a repeated a repeated event. Okay. I think I can go to the next slide. Uh, so measurable objectives, um, me measurable objectives actually are not an enforceable standard of sustainability. They're they're meant to be a goal that uh, that are generally higher than a, a minimum threshold, so uh, maybe harder to achieve, but to provide an operational flexibility the way I look at it, it is you want your plan to try to shoot for these goals. Um, so for, it is required to have a chloride isocon for measurable objectives as well as minimum thresholds, and, and so for uh, measurable objectives, will you, we propose to use the same isocontour line, but use a lower water quality standard, so 100 milligrams per liter, liter for uh, this measurable objective. And all un unintruded wells, are the chloride concentrations have been below 100 milligrams per liter. Next, please. So measurable objectives for groundwater level uh, proxies, if you recall, the, the protective elevations uh, estimated for the district uh, were set at a, a 70th percentile percent protective level. So uh, below that, uh, the district policy has, was considered that an unacceptable risk of exceeding, uh, resulting in salt seawater intrusion. And for minimum thresholds, as I described, uh, we proposed using that same uh, level of risk, and some risk is acceptable for these groundwater level proxies, uh, in my opinion, because the minimum thresholds for chloride isocontin are more definitively dis defines what a seawater intrusion is actually incurring. Uh, but so the me measurable objective uh, is meant to provide a, a goal higher than that level, and, and so we are using the same risk evaluation to set the measurable objective at a uh, a groundwater level that's higher than 95% protective. And in most cases, that's uh, higher than 99% protective in, in the, the evaluation we did uh, of risk. But again, these measurable objectives are more planning goals rather than enforceable standards of sustainability where if, it's, if you don't meet the measurable objective, that's not a situation where the state would come in for, um, for, for controlling the basin or taking over management of the basin. Next, please. So uh, we do use the sustainability management criteria, and then they're the main criteria we've used to evaluate projects and management actions with the basin-wide model. We have uh, used the basin-wide model to look at management actions like pumping redistribution and uh, reduction in overall municipal pumping, uh, City of Santa Cruz ASR project, as well as uh, hypothetical recharge projects in the, in the Romus. Um, and then I will be showing uh, results for pure water so kill. But we're basically, take the model output, we can calculate averages from the model output to be consistent with the 10-year average that we've established for uh, uh, evaluating the groundwater level proxies and compare them both to our proposed minimum threshold and measurable objectives. Uh, we do need to, to raise those uh, groundwater level of proxies to account for sea level rise uh, because they are relative to sea level while our model uh, has as a, a sea level datum that doesn't change over time. So uh, we are simulating sea level rise over time and so uh, the therefore the onshore groundwater levels need to increase a, a corresponding amount to, to continue to prevent that seawater from from coming in. And so sustainability evaluation that the goal should be to reach the measurable objective uh, by 2040 for this critically overdrafted basin and then continue to meet that minimum threshold uh, going forward to 2070. Uh, so that, that is the uh, sustainability management criteria and, and we'll go into um, We'll go into how we've, we've looked at results for pure water. So, Kel, next. So, let me just chime in here. So, one of the reasons uh, asking Cameron to come tonight, besides that y'all requested that, was, you know, he used to just come to this board, and now some of you are, are seeing it. Um, 
I know Dr. Jaffe is on the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee and other two of you are on the MGA, but uh, it's, it's to provide input back. So I know, uh, I just want to point out some of the areas that were dis where there was discussion around, and Cameron, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or anybody else that's been involved on the, on the, on the board that's been involved with that. I think the 10-year average was one of those things, should it be a shorter time or a longer time? Uh, because again, a 10-year average, does that, is that sufficient? Um, so anyway, I just, I'm gonna try to point some of those out if, if I see them as we go forward, so you can provide input for our representatives to take back to the GSP advisory committee or the board. I have a, just a quick question. Yes. How are you calculating the seawater rising? Um, we, we're uh, using the latest projections from the state of California for uh, sea level rise. And so that was a uh, report that was put out last year in 2018. And they provided a range of potential sea level rise over the next uh, 50 plus years uh, for Monterey Bay. Um, and uh, the, a, a range of probabilities for whether the sea level rise would be uh, at that level. And we're, we're using the, the 95th percentile of those probabilities. So the 95% chance that it's not gonna be as high as the 2.3 feet of sea level rise out to 2070 that we're simulating in, in the model. And that's due to the ocean temperatures? Right, so it's, uh, it's due to uh, the climate change that re results in, in uh, ocean temperatures, I, uh, Arctic ice melting, and, and all the factors that. Land, that land based that. ice and thermal expansion, both so things. Yeah, I mean. it's just what are you, the, if the you <coughs> would be forced to change the salinity because of the temperature changes? Oceans, the ocean salinity, um, particularly in a bay, mm -hmm. kind of a bay. Yeah, we haven't looked into that specifically. I think because the drinking water standard, 250 milligram per liter, the minimum threshold we're using, is so much lower than than fully salty water that yeah. that w you have a concern with your your water supply at such a lower level than that that changes in the seawater concentration, I, I don't think would make a huge difference in, in how, how that, that looks over, over time. Um, it would have to change the density significantly, I think, to, to really make a difference. True, but I just yeah. haven't really looked at it very closely lately. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, so we, we do use those, did want to provide that background uh, to give you an update on that, that important part of defining sustainability for, for the basin. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, done groundwater modeling of different sustainability strategies uh, for the MGA. I want to present today specifically uh, the presentation from, from last week on modeling of pure water SoCal. And um, so this, this presentation is exactly what I presented uh, on Wednesday. And so it has some uh, background information that I'm sure you are, are very familiar with, such as what is pure water so kill. Um, so skip over that part, but um, it is, it is a, the, the focus of the presentation is to look at benefits to achieving sustainability for the basin with the, the pure water so kill project. So um, as you're aware, the Pure Water Soquel, the main feature are seawater intrusion prevention wells. This figure shows the location of those wells um, and uh, which, uh, which aquifer, the cross section shows which aquifer units those wells are meant to, to recharge. Uh, you uh, will notice that it's a relatively small area of the district and the basin where these, these wells are located and it is only recharging two of the units that provide groundwater supply. But the project does include uh, aspects that help provide, help benefit other units than what is being directly recharged in other areas than where these seawater intrusion prevention wells are located. Next please. And so uh, what we 
uh, the what was simulated for the EIR included that aspect, which was a, a pumping redistribution around the recharge at the seawater intrusion prevention well. So the down arrows are meant to indicate recharge into the basin and into the A and B C units, and recharging that amount is meant to support increase of pumping from those same units from that same area. And so that's what the plus sign indicates is that going to would increase pumping from that area with the increase in recharge in that area. Uh, what was evaluated for the ER was uh, that increase would support uh, decreases in pumpings in other areas and other units with the minus sign for a decrease in the BC unit and a minus sign in the Aromas area for a decrease in the F unit and the, and the Aromas red sands. And so that is meant to spread out the benefits from the recharge to, to a larger area. Next, please. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So groundwater modeling for the EIR. The EIR is, is focused on evaluating environmental effects uh, from the project. So from the groundwater modeling uh, perspective is to compare to projected existing conditions and show that project raises groundwater levels uh, versus exi projected existing conditions. And that's the main conclusion for EIR impacts from groundwater levels, from the groundwater level perspective. But uh, the, the modeling also provided some lessons for sustainability going forward. Uh, one is that what was simulated for the EIR was that the project recharge would stop after 20 years. and. So you can see that those groundwater levels with the project, which are the two higher curves versus the two lower curves, dropped off uh, pretty quickly after that recharge stopped after 20 years. So um, the conclusion from that is that a recharge would need to continue instead of stopping after 20 years as modeled for the EIR. It also showed us that uh, additional pumping redistribution uh, is possible. We, if you recall, we simulated a decrease of pumping in the BC unit, but at the wells in the BC unit, we saw groundwater levels increase while the project was ongoing. So that pumping decrease seemed, seemed un unnecessary. In fact, the, the recharge into the BC appeared to that it could even support an increase in the BC unit. Another thing that's included in the EIR is an evaluation, next please, sorry, uh, is, is an evaluation of uh, the fate of the purified water that is recharged, how far it gets in the aquifer. Uh, we did more particle tracking in the groundwater model results to see where the results, uh, where the water would go over the long term. And it's important to note that the area where pure the purified recharged water would travel is much smaller than the area where groundwater levels are affected. So you have uh, recharged water going into a small area and that effect can uh, raise groundwater levels in a much, much bigger area. Uh, you can see that the area where the purified water doesn't quite reach our coastal monitoring wells, but we see groundwater levels increase uh, substantially at those coastal monitoring wells with the model. Can we go back to the previous slide? So, for example, the top one, the A unit, the A unit's spatial extent is quite huge. Yes. So where in that spatial extent is this supposed to be measuring? Is it? So this is at the SC5 um, A well. Okay. okay. And so it is the closest A unit well to, uh, it's the closest A unit well to the seawater intrusion prevention well locations. So and the SC9C is the closest BC unit well where we have a protective elevation to those those uh, seawater intrusion prevention wells that, that are uh, planned to recharge into the BC unit. Well, I believe at SC5A, it's completely confined. I mean, there's a, a layer on top of it that's an aquitard, and so groundwater levels actually can't go up because there's a roof on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. So really what we're measuring here isn't groundwater levels, it's, quote, head, unquote, right? It's heads in the aquifer, but in the monitoring wells, they are groundwater levels. That's right, right. sure. Yep, that's right. Okay. And um, I noticed 
you know, when we turn it on, it starts going up and then it flattens off. And even though we're still putting water in every year, it's not going up anymore. And Correct. this is exactly what you see from the uh, monitoring that uh, and modeling that's been done in Scotts Valley for their purification. But they had a nice uh, graph then that showed where it was going. Do mm -hmm. we know where this excess water we're pumping in that's not causing the thing? I mean, Scotts Valley went to streams. Right. It actually showed that stream levels went up and up, and then it flattened out where this flattens out. So that, mm -hmm. and in fact, that's why when you turn it off, it starts going down like that. It's that you know the water is still flowing to wherever it's been flowing in the past, in which right. case the streams. Yeah, we did show uh, changes of water budget plots in the AR. Don't have those specific plots here in this presentation, but we'll, we will show uh, results for the the modeling for the the GSP advisory committee uh, that that gets gets to those ideas, and I, I think we'll answer your question. But do we know how much is going to streams versus how much is going out into the ocean? Because we have both sinks now. Right. It, it's well, we're not. Uh, so what we'll show is for the basin overall. Uh, we can break it down into specific aquifer units, but for the most part, once uh, increase of groundwater levels drops off, the largest outf increase in outflow is offshore, which is okay. which is a, a positive result to prevent seawater intrusion. Exactly. Um, but we also look because this this project includes reduction of pumping in the Romus area, it also increased, it includes an increase in net flow to Paro Valley subbasin, which could be both an increase in flow to Paro Valley subbasin or a decrease in flow from Paro Valley subbasin. So th those are the main, the main uh, water budget flow results of that, that we're simulating. And, and I'd just like to add, you know, one of the enlightening things about the modeling here, and I'm sure you picked it up when you did the EIR, was the old uh, conceptual model was once you fill the basin up, you're good to go, you can leave it, and we can pump back. And the Scotts Valley modeling shows that, but this so shows that very dramatically in the sense that once you stop pumping, what goes up fast comes down very fast. And well. It also shows that this top is not caused by filling the basin. Right. It's when the outflows equal the inflows, then it stops no matter where it is in the, in the extent, vertical extent. Absolutely. But that was just a, um, a shift for us. We realized a constant source is, is, is important, and it's not just fill it up and walk away. I sure. just want to make that sure. clear, because yep. some people were under, I think, you know, that was one model, conceptual model theory uh, uh, 10 years ago, five years ago but that's not the case now. That also means that if you're trying to fill up the basins to be able to take some out in the drought years, you're limiting what you can put in because. Okay. Uh, so for uh, the GSP advisory committee, we did additional runs that evaluated uh, enhancements to uh, Pure Water Soquel to to see whether th the ability to achieve sustainability could be improved. And the main enhancement is to further modify the, the pumping distribution to uh, enhance basin-wide sustainability. And, and trying to uh, isolate in these model runs pure water, the effect of Pure Water Soquel with these enhancements as the main project in action for sustainability, so not combining it with other, with other projects in actions. Uh, the other thing is to learn from what we uh, saw in the, the modeling for the EIR, and that's to see what the effect of project continuing beyond 20 years. We do simulate this under a scenario that we're planning to use for the GSP, a climate change scenario that is called the catalog climate, which uh, won't go into the detail of that, but the last Wednesday's packet does have presentation slides on that and that 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 um the meeting is online as well and we're simulating sea level rise with this with these model runs. Next please. So the different assumptions from the EIR um in include uh, several different assumptions to meet the goals discussed in the past slide. And one of them is related to SoCal Creek Water District demand uh then the EIR uh, 
it followed the projected demand in the district's urban water management plan. And uh, that those projections in include an increase in demand at 2020 from the historically low demand you've had uh, for the past few years. But it, it projects a decrease after that. Um, for these runs, uh, we, we include the same projected bounce back that is included in the urban water management plan projections. But because there have been con questions about whether the decrease uh, will be, will occur based off of what has been learned about efforts to increase housing in the state, land use changes, and also to uh, test the robustness of different projects with simulated stable demand uh, following that, that bounce back for, for these runs. Um, so a, as I mentioned, we learned from the, the previous uh, runs and continue the recharge past the 20 years. The other thing the EIR included was an assumption that the pilot project of a water transfer from City of Santa Cruz would continue to evaluate Pure Water SoCal independently for the GSP, uh, we remove that assumption. That does not preclude actually proceeding with both actions at the same time. This is for evaluating the effects of Pure Water SoCal for the GSP Advisory Committee. Uh, so pumping distribution uh, previously was based off of some work we did for the district a couple years back, and we had updated it for the uh, MGA in advance of, of this modeling um, earlier this year is what we're using. Uh, drought curtailment was assumed uh, as a baseline um, in the EIR, and again to the test of robustness of the ability of Pure Water Soquel to meet sustainability goals, uh, don't uh, uh, assume that curtailment under the baseline conditions for these modeling runs that I'm about to show you. So uh, the, the main enhancement is a change to the, the pumping redistribution uh, and similar symbols as the previous chart. And, and it's the same uh, recharge into the A and B C units at the seawater intrusion prevention wells. Uh, but now uh, we're increased pumping in the A as well as the B C unit as opposed to decreasing in the BC unit, which we simulated before, learning from those previous results. And because uh, the, the SoCal's demand is not meant, is not increased by the project, we can use that increase of pumping near the recharge wells, near the seawater intrusion prevention wells, to decrease pumping in other areas and other units. So that includes the TU unit, uh, the F unit in the Romus area, as and potentially a uh, bay unit in the western part uh, of the district. Ready? The next, please. Well, why is AA not listed there? Is that we're not doing anything with AA? So, um, TU. so TU, actually, the wells where we decrease TU are also screened in the AA, so it does include a decrease in AA as well. Right, right. Uh, this is a, a chart of what. Uh, those volumes look like um, the and going down are basically uh, meant to be additive to the basin either by recharging or reducing pumping. So it's the 1,500 acre feet per year from Pure Waters SoCal Seawater Intrusion Prevention Wells in the A and B C unit to 1,500 acre feet per year, and then an additional decrease in pumping in other units, uh, A, A, AA, TU, F, Aromas. Uh, that is supported by the equal increase in pumping in the units that are being recharged and in the areas where that seawater the seawater intrusion prevention wells are planned. Next, please. So here, here are the, the groundwater level results uh, with and without the project. The green line are the direct modeling results from Pier Water Soquel. The blue dashed line is the 10-year average off of those results. And then the yellow is, is the baseline uh, without the project. And so uh, the modeling results do show that groundwater levels increase versus the baseline as we showed in the EIR, but also 
above a sustainable management criteria in, um, in, in the A unit in this district's area. There was a question at the GSP advisory committee about the decline in groundwater levels uh, simulated here around 2020. Uh, and uh, I'm going to need to clarify my response to that committee. Uh, I, I described it as an increase of demand at that time. Uh, it's actually not an increase of demand at that time. We actually established uh, an initial redistribution of pumping where pumping was increased in the A unit at 2020. So we can see the results of redistribution without the project f before the project is simulated to come online in 2023. So uh, the redistribution has an increase of pumping in the A unit, it drops groundwater levels. And then with the project, with after 2023, those groundwater levels uh, are, are recovered above uh, above the groundwater level proxies to prevent seawater intrusion. Next, please. So going further west in the A unit at the city monitoring wells where uh, they've estimated protective elevations, um, the effect of the project really is only seen at the eastern, uh, eastern monitoring wells, uh, the pleasure point, um, and where there is a groundwater level increase uh, resulting from the project. This, if you recall, we do have a, a reduction pumping in the A unit at the well closest to this well, so that, that is partially contributing, this, that is contributing to this effect. I think it would be interesting to see uh, what kind of effect would be seen without that reduction in pumping at the nearest district well, the, what effect just from, from recharging the A, A unit would be. Uh, this far west, but you don't see uh, much of an effect at all at, at SoCal Point, which is uh, Moran Lake, which are the two wells where uh, the city has observed seawater intrusion in the past or currently. Next, please. So uh, AA and TU units, the d deeper units and the, the bigger effect is seen as the TU unit. Previous modeling showed that previously planned is based off of our model. Uh, previously planned pumping from the TU unit uh, wasn't sustainable and that's we're seeing in the first few years of, of this simulation where groundwater levels are just dropping over time and that they would continue to drop without a redistribution of pumping. Uh, we do, is do simulate a redistribution of pumping uh, starting in 20 and they do start to stabilize because of that but the further redistribution of pumping where uh, TU pumping is is reduced even further, allows uh, groundwater levels to recover in, in the TU unit. Um, and with what we've done, uh, maybe more than, than, is, is ne than is necessary. But that kind of concept is what will, uh, what looks to be necessary to, to use Pure Water Soquel to, to have the use of the TU unit uh, be sustainable over the long term. Yes. So I, I know that Pure Water Soquel was designed to fix the district's problem. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it doesn't quite work for the upper left one there uh, means that you, you would have to again do other enhancements like, uh, like doing some perhaps recharge into the uh, Live Oak area or something like that. Uh, I mean, there are options, yeah, so there are options that it could be recharging to the A unit at there, it could be, um, it, it could be, there is some pumping in the A unit, it could be trying to uh, just pump from the A unit mm -hmm. in those wells, um, uh, modifying those wells, so there, there are different options for for evaluating that, but as, as when just in, in all these simulations, just use district infrastructure to shift around pumping. There's no, right. no uh, change in what the city of Santa Cruz pumping mm -hmm. in that area would be. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it doesn't address uh, any issues near those those city city wells. Um, and I guess by changing the screens, we could, uh, or, or they're changing their screens could help with this as well. That, uh, you, know, you could use less from one aquifer and more from another aquifer. Right, it is a balancing act, but then, um, yeah, but also additional recharge could could help. So that's one of the things I think they'll look at with, with their ASR project, with 
uh, making trying to make sure that their their current pumping it is is protected and sustainable. Uh, next, uh, BC unit. Uh, so if you uh, recall, we have uh, recharge into the BC unit with the seawater intrusion prevention wells, but are also increasing pumping um, from the BC unit. And you can see that with the project, even with that increased pumping, we're able to, to raise groundwater levels um, at, uh, in, at the wells near Atlas Creek that may uh, not increase enough. So they would potentially take some adjustment of how much the nearest well pumps uh, to to do that, and that just points to that a need for adaptive management with your system around this project, that there isn't just going to be one set pumping distribution uh, to move forward with, and you'll, s you'll be able to, s you'll, you'd, you'd want to monitor what the results will be and, and change, uh, change operation based off of that, not on the modeling that has been done to date, so you'll have actual information uh, when, when you operate the system. Now, in the operation of pure water, are we assuming the three recharge wells would all be recharged equally? No. Uh, so these simulations include uh, recharge into two of the three wells, and uh, the recharge is higher into the, the well in the Twin Lakes Church Cabrillo College area because it's uh, recharging the two units um, versus the, the Monterey. Um, okay. So that, that's one part of the information we hope to get from the, the pilot well is what, whether we can uh, refine those estimated capacities. Next. Next, yes, please. So the Romus area in the, in the southeast of the district, and this is not an area where uh, yet you would have seawater intrusion prevention wells recharging uh, these aquifers, but the redistribution of pumping is meant to uh, reduce pumping from this area, and uh, you can see the the positive effect of reducing pumping uh, by by redistribution of pumping around around the Pure Water SoCal project. So the green and blue lines uh, are higher than the baseline and uh, get up towards the, the sustainable management criteria to prevent seawater intrusion. Question, like on the on the page before, or the slide before, um, or you could potentially, like if you weren't getting a fast enough response on the, you know, the one on the right, the pr Prisma BC unit, um, 8RC, you could decrease pumping to there and get that to respond more quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Right now it's not above protective levels to like 2040. So you could make those adjustments, I'm assuming. Right, I mean for, you could. Um, I mean, for Sigma, the goal is to to get to the measurable objectives by 2040 and not have yeah. groundwater levels below minimum thresholds after that. But um, if you had, if you want to recover faster, you you would say, okay, we're above. We've achieved what we needed at these other two wells. What can we do closer to to this well that's not quite there yet? Uh, next, please. Ready. So this is, uh, this is a, a response to an earlier question about uh, what is the change in where water flows to related to Pure Water SoCal. So this is a water budget plot where the, the positive numbers um, are represent the net recharge from the project, and the net recharge is the amount that's recharging into the seawater intrusion prevention wells of 1,500 acre feet per year, because overall, the redistribution pumping doesn't change to the pumping, you're just moving the pumping around and, and balancing it. So the, the project provides 1,500 acre feet per year, what results in the flows because of that. Initially, a lot of those flows result in groundwater level increases, and these are the black lines that are referred to uh, increase of groundwater in storage during the project, but just as those groundwater levels pl pl flatten out, as pointed out, that increase of groundwater level, groundwater in storage uh, decreases over time. Um, and then the other big flows, as I mentioned, are the yellow bars and increase of a flow offshore to help prevent seawater intrusion, uh, so that that's, that's 
meeting the goals of the project. And then there are an increase in the net outflow to, to Pajaro Valley uh, because you're raising groundwater levels uh, close to the Pajaro Valley subbasin. Next, please. We also have a plot showing the area of groundwater level increased by Pure Water Soquel uh, with enhancements. And this is where looking at all the aquifer units across the basin and where uh, the combination of both recharge at the seawater intrusion prevention wells and the pumping redistribution will raise groundwater levels. And because you have the combination of those things in a Pure Water Soquel project, you can uh, raise groundwater levels in multiple units throughout the coastal area of, of the basin. Now this, as I showed earlier, these areas are where groundwater levels increase, and this area is much larger than where uh, the purified water actually travels. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. Nicely Thanks, done. Lynn. Well done. I think we asked our questions as we were going in this. Um, well, I have one other question. Good thing you didn't have to save them all up. I know the <laughs> ci I know the city's been doing some look at their either INLU, as they call it, or ASR. Yes. Um, how are those going? What are they showing? Uh, so the, s the city has done, they're, they're not as far along uh, with evaluating, so it's all a preliminary feasibility study. And so there is no actual project they're evaluating. They're evaluating uh, just ideas for projects. Um, and so it includes, um, it includes in lieu, they're looking at in lieu, that includes um, ASR only, so with where they recharge directly into uh, new city wells and extract from those say, same wells, and that includes combinations of, of those two. Um, so for one thing about the in lieu, that there's, uh, it's a includes a provision of, of water supply for Soquel Creek Water District to reduce the pumping, uh, but that takes place across the, the district. And then for uh, what they've evaluated so far and we've helped them evaluate is that the recovery of the water is to the west, uh, mostly either in the city or the very western portion of the, of the district. Um, actually, I think it's all, all in the city. And extracting from that location when in lieu recharge is occurring uh, throughout the district um, does not recover that storage that, that, uh, that efficiently. So again, that is uh, a first cut at what in lieu would, process would look like, and they do plan to refine it and look at different ways of applying that that, that might uh, achieve their water supply goals, which are very different from the GSP sustainability goals um, in, in better fashion. The, the, the results where the injection recharges in at specific wells and extraction from those same wells do appear to meet their water supply goals better than the in lieu. Uh, the, the, that also we looks at that, that provides, and it provides benefits for sustainability, but it's what has been looked at so far isn't something that, that achieves sustainability in a broad, broad area. Mm -hmm. And their in lieu still is just in the winter months then, or are they looking at? Well, it's, it's based off of when the water supply is available, so it, it can go beyond the winter, winter months, so it's uh, modeling of surface water flows, the city's demands, um, the, the, the requirements for requirements for flows, keeping flows in, 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 the, in the rivers, and then what could be available uh, for, what they've evaluated is what could be available for meeting their water supply okay. goals. Right. So I'll, I'll add that at yeah. the GSP advisory committee level that uh, in an upcoming meeting, we're gonna see uh, enhanced results of their initial modeling. Remember their initial modeling showed when they pulled out, it was not good water level. So they're going back and improving that. So Cameron at some point will present that. And then in addition, overlay that run with this run and see kind of coupled together in some shorter fashion, what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Right, Cameron? Yeah, so we, we will, we are uh, scheduled to present our, combination of, of this run with the city's ASR only project that has been done so far because mm -hmm. 
it's been done so far. Their in lieu uh, is not compatible with exactly what pure water so kill because their in lieu includes reductions in pumping at some of the same well where uh, these pure water soil projects have increases in pumping, and, right. and, and that does not work together. Some kind of adjustment would be have to be made to how that plan uh, works out. Their ASR only is city, new city wells, so it, it is possible to simulate. Uh, what has been simulated are city SR wells that are pretty close to the seawater intrusion prevention wells, so uh, we will see see what the result, we will show what the results of that were. But all these city runs have been with the preliminary evaluation of projects to, to meet uh, the city's water supply needs uh, yeah. dur during shortages. It hasn't been to, to meet sustainability goals. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, if, can I? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just looking for questions. Go ahead. I so think Bruce, you had a question. Okay. It seems like this could be a, a useful tool for planning how we manage the aquifer in the in the future, or the aquifers? It, do you come to the same conclusion that it could be a tool for that? Yeah, I, I do. Okay. It, 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 I think this isn't. This shouldn't be just for the GSP. Once the GSP is submitted on January 2020, that uh, you're done with using the modeling. I think you can still do some planning uh, as you plan the project to see uh, what how to the best use the project to, to meet the goals of the basin and the district and then input new information on as we get yeah yeah, yeah correct right so the you city can update says the you model can have as you go along yeah. city says you can have x number of acre feet of river water transfer then we can optimize how that that's used right right yep that's great. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a comment. Yes. Let my hydrology sides shine. I think the three things that, that I learned from this, um, the modeling effort and just going along with pure water was, one, the quantity estimated is, is about right. The 1,500 acre feet needed by Soquel Creek Water District is, is pretty close to on target. Uh, could be a plus or minus a little bit more, and the basin needs obviously needs a little bit more in, in what I'm seeing. The constant source was, you know, the quick drop off, so that was another one. And the idea of uh, recharging in a small area is a cost effective way uh, combined with the uh, redistribution of pumping, I thought was very smart. The way, mm -hmm. I guess that's what you were getting at, Dr. Yeah. Jaffe, the, using the model as a tool. So, um, I think it, it points very positively. I mean, when we saw these results, I know I was excited to see them. It just was a good good sign. Yeah, and I think it's good for the Mid-County Groundwater Agency as a whole yeah. to be able to come up with something that gives us a sustainable plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. This thank you. Information only. Um, and, um, but I'll allow for, uh, this now is be time for public comment. Colonel Terry again. The big picture is you have a regional water shortage and a statewide water shortage and you have overconsumption and over depletion. And you have, as I've mentioned before, with lots of evidence to support it, 40 years of mismanagement by this SoCal Creek Water Department and its board of directors. Uh, what I just saw is a patina. It's a patina it ignores because you are participating in a scheme that is fundamentally fraudulent and fundamentally flawed. And that is the solution is obvious, a regional approach to water resources in California to include consolidation with Santa Cruz, but wider, regional statewide consolidation that would respect the pres preservation of the aquifer, which has been neglected by this board of directors for 40 and especially the last 25 years. That's why you're in the situation we're in. But again, the solution is a statewide control of the water resources and regional consolidation, plain and simple. And by the way, 82 units for toilets at Cabrillo, madam, 
hardly justifies the incredible, extraordinary depletion for decades of approving the Aptos Village Project, which this panel did irresponsibly and negligently. And your EIR in support of poop water, uh, pure water Soquel, which could be, should be called poop water Soquel, I find as somebody who knows about EIRs and worked on billion dollar projects for a couple of them, totally deficient. I find it fraudulent. I also find it really sad that Mr. Basso, your legal counsel, who's compensated very handsomely, has to hire an expensive lawyer from Southern California to confront Becky Steinbrenner in front of Judge Gallagher in her effort to get a TRO, temporary restraining order, to stop your efforts to have a better look at pure water Soquel and the, and the flaws in your EIR process and contents. So you hire this lawyer to come up from, Sacra from Southern California, paying her legal expenses and her fees overhead expenses because Maybe. Mr. Basso hasn't got the competence? Is that this the problem? This was a comment on the information no, item that we just received. From relates, it's related. Right, but but it, it's, it's re this is a comment on the last item. Yeah, and that item overlapped into pure water Soquel. That was so not on anything of the substance Soquel of the actual and your EIR? presentation. And the, the litigation, it's, it totally encompasses that, Mr. Doctor. Log both logically and factually. This was an informational item. Yeah, on, and, and, on, and he on provided that hydrologic and, monitoring. And that information was f is used as evidence to support your EIR, which Ms. Steinbrunner has very astutely and honorably properly contested. And Judge Gallagher caved in to his former Thank law you, partner. Your time is up. I'd like to, I'd lastly. No, uh, your time is no, up. No, I'd Thank like you. Mr. Basso to explain how much no. was paid your for defending that action. Your time is up. Thank Ask you. Ask Mr. Sit down, Basso please. to describe how much he provide what he paid the lawyer in Southern California, down, and why your in-house counsel didn't Sit defend down, against Miss Steinbrenner, a non-lawyer who's Do besting you. I have you. to have somebody remove you, sir. That can happen. Hi, um, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, thank you very much, Cameron, for that report. I I always learn so much when you give these um, reports, and, and I think it's really inter interesting information. Thank you very much. I, um, I would appreciate, as a citizen, if, if there were some good delineations, and, and I think you did have a color diagram there showing that where the Prisma aquifer interacts and overlaps with the Aromas aquifer, because they are different aquifers. And um, I, I think that presenting public information like that would, would really enhance your presentation. So thank you for that. I had some questions. Um, I'm, I'm curious how the Pure Water SoCal injection um, wells could flow into, cause water to flow into the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. The, the Pajaro Valley area. That's, that's hard for me to understand unless you extrapolate that you're pumping less from the um, Aromas Aquifer in the seascape right. area. Is yeah, that yeah. it? That's so it's not direct correlation, it's just right. that you're, you're pumping less in there and so yes. that's helping them. All right, thank you, that clears that up. And um, how do you know? <laughs> I, I like those graphs where you, you kind of top out, but how do you know that's what happens? How, how, what, where do you get the information to create that modeling? And um, I thought it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard you say, Cameron, that the current conditions are not considered unsustainable. So that's kind of double negative, but, but current conditions as they are could be considered sustainable. I'd, I'd like some clarification, make sure that I heard that properly. Um, I also want to know why there is a projected uh, sudden increase in demand in the year 2020 when um, Santa Cruz City's projection for, for water demand are flat. And uh, what would cause specifically in the year 2020 a sudden increase in demand and then it levels out. And um, I also want to know if you're going to model for the GSP 
uh, the water <coughs> transfers. I saw that you did not, and you said that that was just so you could model Pure Water SoCal for the GSP, and I'd like to know which, uh, if that's the transfers are going to be modeled. My final comment is, were these criteria developed by the executive committee or the GSP advisory committee? Because I've never seen these kinds of very detailed discussions at the, the committee level. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay. That item was information only. I'd like to clarify one thing. If yeah. I might. Sure. Uh, the Prisma, all layers of the Prisma go all the way under Watsonville, go around the bay. In fact, the USGS has done some studies of the ages of those waters. And uh, so, you know, the, the whole thing goes all the way around the bay. Okay. Um, next is uh, item 6.3. So tonight, item 6.3 is to bring back ordinance 1901 for final adoption. Um, there have been no changes to the ordinance that you saw on February 19th or to the attached schedules. So this evening, we're just asking you by motion and roll call vote to adopt Ordinance 19 and the supporting schedules. Thank you, Leslie. Anybody? No questions? questions? Okay. Thank you. Public comment? Uh, my name is John Cole. I'm a at resident of Aptos and a district uh, customer. From your core values posted on your website, I quote, our values represent the district's culture and ad address the question, what do we stand for? Core questions accompany our core values and should be asked when major policy decisions are being considered by the board, unquote. So regarding your core values of fairness, honesty, and ethics, each of you should ask yourself before voting to adopt Ordinance 1901, does the decision slash action treat all concerned fairly, honestly, and ethically? I pointed out a serious flaw in the design of the tier one threshold for SFR and MFR. In an attempt to harmonize the tier structure, you invented a false proxy to twist US census occupancy data. Leslie Strong makes this completely inaccurate assertion, quote, because US census data reflects similar occupancy rates for both SFR and MFR households, the district is proposing that both classes have the same tier thresholds, unquote. The census records do not reflect that. The census occupancy rates are based on owner-occupied or renter-occupied housing units. But in your rate study, you twist this by insinuating that all SFRs are owner-occupied and all MFRs are renter-occupied. That's, <laughs> that's absurd. Equalizing the tier one threshold allotment of MFRs and SFRs actually created a disproportionate cost of service for water consumption between these classes. As I indicated in my email to you, an SFR customer will pay substantially more for consuming the same amount of water as an MFR. That's not fair, not honest, and not ethical. Furthermore, Raftella states that the rate structure results in 94% of MFR water use occurring in Tier 1. What does that tell you? you are, you're essentially giving MFR accounts a uniform rate at $6.43 per unit since they'll rarely consume Tier 2 water. Of the district's top 10 principal customers in 2018, five were multifamily homeowner associations, not renter associations, homeowner associations. I wonder how many of these multifamily customers are in the 94% bracket. Please don't approve this ordinance right now. Instead, move to request that Raffaele's come back and fix that flaw. Then approve the resulting correct ordinance, and therefore your decision action will treat all concerned fairly, honestly, and ethically. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner, and I really suggest that you listen to Mr. Cole. I was here when he came to you before with the um, problems that he had spotted very diligently and thoroughly, and you blew him off. <laughs> and he took you to court and he won. So I'm asking you to postpone your vote on this to correct the issues that Mr. Cole has very carefully pointed out to you, and then go back and do it again. I also ask that you not approve this because it is 
and was stated at the public hearing to bring in the revenue that is necessary for the Pure Water SoCal project, which is currently under litigation. When an agency takes action like this during impending litigation, you do so at your own risk, and you are taking a risk. If you put any faith in the CEQA process, if you put any respect in the public process, then you need to pause on your vote for this project, for this ordinance that would fund the Pure Water SoCal project. You also need to consider what at your hearing on February 19th, Mr. Boyd pointed out to you. He's also suing you that this unfairly penalizes households with large families. That's not fair. So there are a lot of problems with this, and I ask you to not uh, approve this ordinance to fix the problems. And, and above all, listen to your ratepayer here, Mr. Cole. He has my deep respect. He's a man that's very astute. He studies things carefully. He has brought to your district many problems, some of which were not really made clear but when he met with the Raftalis uh, representative and Ms. Strom, he pointed out some things that then Ms. Strom came to you and you corrected them. She didn't give Mr. Cole the credit for it, but it was from his very astute and careful examination that those corrections came. So please do not appro approve this at all. Thank you. Colonel Terry Maxwell on the same point. I want to compliment Mr. Cole's efforts, both in the litigation he brought before, and it's tragic he had to do so. <coughs> and once again, it's because of the negligence, the irresponsible negligence, contrary to your oaths of office, demonstrated by this board of directors and by your staff and your staff and your lawyer. Okay? Now, in addition, Mr. Cole's current complaint is absolutely correct. I endorse, as Becky did, uh, that you decline to approve. Also, I still want the evidence supporting the approval of the 17 hotel units in Aptos. And I asked Mr. if Mr. Uh, Prakesh Pat Patel, the developer there, is a client in any way of Mr. Basso or his law firm, anyone affiliated with him. I'd like to have that answered. And I'd like Mr. DeFore to answer how he justified approval of the 19 units and why you would do so. <sighs> Again, the only solution seems to be you cannot be trusted to respect the water resources of this district. You cannot be respected to respect the money and the payments made by your customers. And you cannot respect the long-term future. That you would even consider approval of Pure Water SoCal, again, when there are other alternatives. It's tragic. The water's available. The Lockerfer solution makes it available. Uh, river access makes it available. Other storage and consolidation regionally of the water resources. Every minute you delay doing that, ladies and gentlemen, is irresponsible negligence on your part and failure to address the real problem and bona fide solutions of the large problem. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, that is all the public comment. Board, we had no questions. Yes, sir. What's the staff's position on this MFR SFR issue and it was brought up? We think the analysis was done correctly. It's similar to what uh, is done for uh, Santa Cruz and others. Is that what you're asking me? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, any motions? <coughs> I'll move approval. I will second. Roll call, please. Director Lather? No. Vice President Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President LeHue? Yes. Okay, we're gonna move on to item, um, let's see, we're at 6 .4. update 6.4. Update on coordination with the City of Santa Cruz. Page 133. Hi, good evening. I'm going to give a small presentation on this item, which um, 
We'll just again quickly highlight the water supply challenges and why we're pursuing Pure Water SoCal. The timeline, the overview of the coordination, which was the main premise for this item tonight to report back from the February 5th meeting on the efforts between the City of Santa Cruz and, and the district. Um, give a little bit of images on the full facility down at Santa Cruz. And then um, Ron is gonna talk a little bit about the um, Chanticleer site. So again, um, I think I won't um, go over too much the things that Cameron talked about in terms of the water supply challenges and the modeling that's been done. But just to reiterate to those who may um, not know really the background of the project, our basin is in a state of overdraft. It is identified as one of the 21 basins in California critically overdrafted because of the seawater intrusion and a high priority basin because our sole source of water is groundwater. We don't have any other water that's imported or brought in to our area. Again, this, this problem is real. Um, I know that uh, some people don't quite understand always what the what the real meaning is. They see the model, but um, that illustration on the right is a bottle of water. I know it look, just looks like water, but that is a bottle of water that has 15,000 parts per million of chlorides. And uh, just in what we heard from Cameron in his previous presentation, the threshold is 250 parts per million. So you can see the magnitude of um, seawater contamination that is occurring in those areas of the coastal monitoring wells where those dots are red and orange. The picture on the left is Mr. Pete Cartwright. He is a district customer who also owns a private well in the Sel La Selva Beach area. He came to us late last year um, to explain to us his issues that he's having and how he has lost his private well because of seawater intrusion. And again, uh, we've known that we've had seawater intrusion at both ends of the district for some time. We weren't quite sure uh, what the extent was along the entire coastline. Um, the data that was collected in 2017 with the SkyTem, which was an aerial geophysical survey, um, captured really what the extent is along the entire coastline. And this uh, information was presented in 2018 to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency by SkyTem and Ramble, the two uh, companies that performed this survey to us. And then we had Hydrometrics, and now who's now Montgomery, assess and analyze really what the, the implications were. And <coughs> the I wanted to highlight just kind of the, the summary of that analysis. In that report that Hydrometrics uh, concluded back in March of 2018, the close proximity of the interface also provides a reason to set a goal to recover the groundwater levels sooner than the 2040 deadline to achieve sustainability required by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And I just wanted to point that out because I know there is a lot of heightened awareness um, related to the rates and also that the district is pursuing outside grant funding and that is not just the only sole driver. Um, one of them, of course, is fiscal responsibility. Uh, we obviously wanna try to make a project that's affordable to our ratepayers, but another goal is obviously environmental stewardship. And I think this just illustrates, again, it's not just this state mandate deadline, it's also trying to get ahead of that due to the scientific data that we've collected. Tony, can I just chime in for a second? This may not be known to every board member, but actually, Stanford University is working with the outfit that did that um, analysis there, and I asked them if I could, they're writing a paper on it, and I asked them if I could share this result, and they said yes. And what their result is, they think that the proximity of the seawater intrusion is even closer to shore than what Ramble has, has shown. So that paper will be forthcoming, but I just thought it was, um, Interesting, you have a, a you know a, a third party university, Stanford, analyzing that and thinking that it's actually a little worse than what they portrayed it as. So, um, just really appreciate just kind of setting that that premise of the problem, and then to go on into really what the item six point four is is to discuss the coordination efforts that have been underway with the city of Santa Cruz and SoCal Creek Water District staff. As you know, the board took action um, on December 18th to um, pursue the tertiary component of the Pure Water SoCal project 
at Santa Cruz and then the purification components at Chanticleer. Uh, also to continue coordinating with the city to see if there was the opportunity to develop the full purification down at Santa Cruz. So this is just an illustration of the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment facility over by Neri Lagoon. As we look a little bit closer into that facility site, the blue box that's illustrated here with this white arrow is the 60 by 120 uh, area that is the footprint that the city of Santa Cruz Public Works Department had identified as an area that the district could construct and build a portion of the Pure Water SoCal project. So within the EIR, we looked at three options. One was just to do a pump station only that would then deliver secondary treated effluent over to a satellite or an off-site purification facility. The second option was to do um, the full facility down there. That would be a two-story facility, and I have some illustrations following this slide. And then the third option was a tertiary facility. That would mean just the tertiary components of the microfiltration or ultrafiltration components that would bring the water to a tertiary level. Tertiary is used for uh, non-potable irrigation uses. And then that water would then would be um, uh, conveyed to a off-site purification facility. So <coughs> this is an illustration that we had in the um, EIR, and this is what the full purification facility would look like. Uh, this is a two-story facility that would hold uh, the components necessary to purify 1,500 acre feet a year for the district's uses. As you can see, this is an illustration of what the footprint would look like from the bottom story. And this is the bottom level where we would have um, uh, most of the facilities that would be supplemental to the actual uh, purification, um, but they are necessary. And then the, the actual treatment components would be on the top. So this is a cutaway illustration that shows that the, the membrane treatment, which is the microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and then the UV light would be on the top, and then the ancillary uh, components would be on the bottom. I guess before I get to the, um, the recommendation, I did want to just reiterate that and, and give some background. It's included in the um, handout. The city and district staff met, and we talked and coordinated on quite a few issues related to what the opportunities and what the constraints were at the site. Uh, we talked about issues such as permitting, ownership, regulations, whether or not the facility would change classifications with the purification facility on site. We talked a lot about what kind of um, projects that they have as well. And we talked about um, what, what types of expansion or multiple uses there could be. And in, in those discussions, these are some of the, the findings that came out. So um, to kind of state, go to the conclusion first, um, the city of Santa Cruz and the district staff still recommend at this time that we pursue the tertiary development at Santa Cruz. And really this recommendation is based on um, the space constraints at that site. That site is very landlocked. Um, it is a very small, tight space. There is a lot of traffic that goes in and out. When we sited that 60 by 20 footprint, we had to cone that off originally, and that really is about the only part available that they are willing for us to, de to develop on with leaving some flexibility for them in the future if they ever wanted to do something. They, they would still have to move and relocate things, but they wanted to leave that to their, to their discretion. Um, in terms of construction impacts, the city of Santa Cruz is undergoing a master facilities infrastructure planning. Um, they have a, a 10 year lookout in terms of what kind of capital improvement projects are underway. Currently they do about $1 million to $2 million a year in CIP projects. They're forecasting that that would ramp up to about four four to six million dollars a year. So there is some construction impacts that are going to be underway at the same time as the proposed Pure Water SoCal project, and that was a concern to staff that that level of construction for both this, the city and the district project, um, as noted in the board memo, a two-story facility for the full advanced purification down at that site um, requires piles, it requires you know, a, a lot of construction, and so that was of concern to their staff. 
Another thing was that once the water was purified down at Santa Cruz, that would be purified water. And then to purify that water and come over to, this, to the Capitola, Aptos, Soquel area, that would limit the um, future opportunities for um, delivering water if they chose to in the future for uh, irrigation purposes. Tertiary water or non-potable um, drinking uh, tertiary water could be used for irrigation. If we were to branch off on the purified line, that's that water is a little bit over treated for that level of use. And then of course, um, the last thing is, as you could see, that, that two-story building um, doesn't really leave a lot of expansion for either the city or the district. Um, th the city and the district, just in terms of their collaboration and trying to identify where there were some nexuses or, or dual benefits for a tertiary facility there, the city uh, did like and I think were interested in that the tertiary facility would be single story, um, that the construction impacts would be less, that there was the opportunity for tertiary to come over to our area and that because of that footprint and in the initial discussions that we've had related to um, a tertiary facility there in that footprint, there is room for them they see as potential expansion if they so choose in the future. I would just like to note, um, you know, our, our coordination um, efforts have been far and wide, not just with the discussions of the full facility down there. We continue to work with them quite a bit. Um, I did want to note that just last month, the City of Santa Cruz was awarded uh, an Engineering Innovation Award by the local California Water Environment Association for the tertiary uh, treatment pilot project that we had there in the summer. That was a joint collaboration between the city and the district, and they won an award on that, so we're very proud uh, of their achievement on that. Um, they've also provided us a letter of support, so we've received over 14 letters of support for the Prop 1 implementation grant, and the city of Santa Cruz was one of those letters. And then um, they also wanted to reaffirm, they recognized that in the MOU, which was the memorandum of understanding that they executed uh, between the city and the district in 2017, they recognized two things. One was the delivery of the source water, the treated effluent. Um, they would provide, albeit this district continued and went forward with um, the environmental review and also they took action. And so because of your actions on December 18th, they wanted to formalize in a letter that they recognize that you had done that and they are still on a path to provide water and they are willing and interested to continue with the next part that's identified in that MOU, which is a project agreement. And so the project agreement as outlined in that MOU really discusses more about the terms related to any co-location of the facilities and also just terms of a contract. And so we are working on, on that next piece with them. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm the next part, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So um, there's two components to this. Uh, the board asks us to work with the city of Santa Cruz to see the, fe uh, the feasibility of the uh, entire facility down there, or and in, and in conjunction continue to explore the Santa Clara site. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. But let me just be clear. So when the water, whatever, uh, this is what goes out to the ocean now, on average, eight million gallons a day, mm -hmm. I believe, secondary affluent uh, water. If you open it, you can smell it. Uh, we've never had anybody say it had any odor. Kitchen sink, our water, pond water are the three primary. Once that gets treated, this is, it would be treated to this. It looks the same, I know. This is tertiary treated water, so that's what, what is being proposed down at the city of Santa Cruz now, take that secondary water and then that goes out to the ocean, uh, get, provide us that water, then treat it down there to the tertiary level, which you can apply on playing fields, organic crops or whatnot. And then at the Santa Clara site, you, this, these are bottled waters that other agencies provide to us where they purify it and they can, you can actually drink it. So that's what this water is. So I just, I think it's nice to see that visual. So with that concept in mind, We've um, 
uh, and then uh, furthering the negotiations and the discussions on the Chanticleer site, we've met with John Leopold and uh, uh, others several times, met with uh, county uh, economic redevelopment and those folks, John, uh, Supervisor Leopold asked us uh, to get together and see, see what, uh, what value we could bring to Live Oak besides just helping save the basin, which is a big lift in itself. But uh, so we've done that, and here's the site in, in uh, off S Highway 1 there, the corner of Soquel and Chanticleer. The next site, so here it is, uh, uh, existing view. Everybody knows it by the old house that's been there for 30 years, and it's, it is what it is, right? So right there, it's next to the, behind the glass shop. Um, and so, so we've been doing that. We've been having conversations, not only with the county, but uh, here's another site, thank you. Uh, you can see just a re rendering from the outside. However, what a lot of people didn't know when we've had discussions with uh, Live Oak folks is that, um, and here's another uh, picture, is that for the last, I don't know, I think it's 10 years, the, uh, RTC, Regional Transportation Commission. Commission, thank you, um, has been working on an overpass from uh, to help people bicycle or walk over from the other side of Highway 1 on Chanticleer where it dead ends to the Live Oak side. Maybe both sides are Live Oak, but over Highway 1 anyway. And so when we engaged the RTC and said, hey, we're evaluating uh, purchasing this property, they said, That'd be fantastic because they have just completed the approval of the EIR for this bicycle uh, overpass. And this is a rendition, I think, out of their uh, diagram, out of their EIR. And so you, what you're seeing here is the bicycle path coming over Highway 1 and then coming down along Soquel Avenue in front of the property. So what happens is, on the piece of property where we're evaluating putting the, the facility, this bicycle ramp comes down at an angle, uh, pretty much obliterating the whole frontage along Soquel, which is frontage along a road is the most valuable for commercial. So it kind of puts the, um, uh, <laughs> it puts it out of running for commercial entities to have stores or whatnot over there. And so it devalues the property in many ways. Now here's another picture of the overpass, the pedestrian bridge is what they call it. So the RTC is really excited that we'd be a willing partner uh, in that. And I think it's a big asset personally to Live Oak. I'm a Live Oak uh, community member to have an overpass there because if you try 41st or down at Soquel, it, it's kind of crazy. And I do use my bike a lot on those. So that's one aspect. Um, but we've also been brainstorming what else uh, could value could be added. I know meeting with the uh, Live Oak uh, school people that Melanie and I presented to a couple times, the and something that's in the uh, ranks high in the value system of the board is some kind of educational component. So that's another uh, 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 potential value we could bring there. We have that robustly throughout our system, but tours, school, uh, uh, models or, or you know uh, learning center there uh, and I and I love that I've said it before because water and wastewater have uh, dual tracks to where you can enter this industry not just with a college age education but also kind of an apprenticeship grade one through five so it, 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 it spans a whole host of ways for uh, people to learn and uh, enter this field and we do believe the purification of water is kind of the future but back go back one slide so here's just a few brainstorm or not actually not brainstorm these are actual facilities oops go back up to this that um, you know that are existing that one in the bottom left I believe is A to Z it takes pure waste water and recycles it to purified water and the other two I think do something similar to what we're looking at actually taking uh, treated w uh, water and, and refining it. So a lot of recent uh, coordination efforts. I think we've made uh, good progress um, and we'll continue to do that uh, as we move forward. So I wanted to give you that other side of um, not just working with Santa Cruz, but where we're at with uh, uh, progress on the Santa Clara site. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, informational. I had one question and you know, this is informational, but we were going to 
you know, we had made some, had some discussion about um, proceeding, how much to go with planning of a, you know, design of a, of a project. And so I assume that this would mean we would, you know, give guidance if we wanted to just focus on this one site rather than the other for any expenditure of money or towards design. Yeah. Okay. Bruce? Why wasn't this an action item? Why is this informational only? I mean, obviously we're going to take action based on this, and it's only from staff, so there's no board approval of that action. Well, I think number two is uh, gives it the ability to just direct us to work with the city to and follow down just on this item alone. Well, it's not just the city. It's uh, our, our consultants who are doing the design. Right. I mean, this isn't... This is a milestone. Well, we're continuing we're to do that. Based on it. We're doing that from your last meeting, I believe. We, we have that, that mandate already to go forth with that. What we're, I think, saying here is direction to just focus on this site. That's right. That's what you're yes. saying. That's what we're asking. Do you want to provide we direct can't, staff? We can't do that. This is information only. That's what we should have no. done. There should have been action by the board to say, yes, we accept it. We're no longer thinking about putting the facility, well, we can, our facility down the city. Okay. Well, we can Can't definitely do that. do that in the meantime. If you'd like to direct us just to focus on this, we can bring it back and solidify it more if you like. We'd be glad to do that. Okay, that's what should have been done. Okay, I apologize. Um, okay, other questions, comments from the board? Well, I was the one who wanted uh, this to be explored further. And I think staff is, is very diligent in it. And the thing that um, is new to me is that there's not an economy of scale with having the facility at the, down at the wastewater treatment f plant. So it's not really probably attractive to, sa to Santa Cruz since there's not a, a benefit to them. So I'd be, um, I think they should take a, a, a back seat at this moment to other locations. Okay, and I'm, you know, I, I was in favor of giving it another, you know, month of investigation, and um, I appreciate all that work, and it seems like it's clarified itself pretty well. And I think we did make, you know, our goals made that if this didn't, uh, then we can direct staff, I think, to go pers keep proceeding with with the way we're, we're going with, with that site. You know, it's, um, so is any public comment? Oh, yeah, Carla. Um, so, we're, this is mostly, you're mostly focusing it on tertiary treatment? Yeah, that's, that's the idea is that Santa Cruz thinks it's most advantageous for them to do tertiary treatment down there because then they, if they can irrigate uh, the most cost effectively if they want to in the future with the line, if they chose to all the way to this facility <coughs> or use the purification water afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so tertiary treatment down there, continue to pursue that, and uh, purification at the Chanticleer facility site. So do they have a, do they personally have a timetable on an agreement of that? Yeah. Time? Yes, um, we're both shooting in terms of the staff to try to do something and bring it back by in late spring, early spring. Mm -hmm. well, then that would be the, a good time to you know, final discussion on this. Um, yeah, I, I was just um, conferring with um, Mr. Basso. I think on the action that was taken by the board on December 18th, when you approved the project to prioritize development of tertiary at Santa Cruz and the purification at, at Chanticleer while, while also coordinating with the city of Santa Cruz as long as no schedule develops occur, um, I think we've done that. I think that if we were to do something more, if we wanted to wait or something, they they there's they they prefer us not to do anything. So uh, that is a scheduled delay, in terms of the full purification. So we we feel that there may not need to be a formal action. You've already taken that, and that the action on February fifth, when you did approve the full budget amount, but you asked us to come back on on the fifth, you can s direct us. You approve the money. You can direct us not to spend that amount. And on the additional basis of design report for the full purification at Santa Cruz. So that, I think it's $300,000. You can direct us without an action to not spend that. 
and, and we won't we can, do that. We can have a motion and a vote to that, to direct staff, you know, to just to clarify. Um, but first, any opportunity for public comment? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I, um, I urge you not to do this. This is an end run, and I think it violates the Brown Act. Your, your agenda that has been posted is, says, receive update on coordination with the City of Santa Cruz on the Pure Water SoCal project. That does not indicate to the public you're going to take any action. And You'll be violating the Brown Act. And um, I urge you, if you value your transparency with the public, not to do this. Um, I also want to say, just commenting on a few other things, uh, I'm stunned that you're trying to do this, quite frankly. Um, I want to know on the, uh, I see that you're proceeding with, in closed session, the uh, acquisition and lease agreement on the Chanticleer property. So it seems like um, you have, in fact, made up your mind. But um, I also want to ask, what is the, uh, there's an abandoned well or something on the Chanticleer property. It's visible from the road on SoCal Avenue. I want to know what that is. There's no record in county environmental health files, which don't go back all that far. And this property has, as Director Lather said, some interesting historic use. So what is that well there? And I, th I hope that you're doing due diligence to investigate those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to know um, what, are, what have been the historic uses of this property? It was discussed as new information during the December 18th um, public meeting that there are some questions and maybe some questionable uses there that could have brought about contamination. Um, I want to point out that the bottles of water <laughs> look like the same ones that you had a picture of with the um, dangerously high chloride level. <laughs> you know, it's not a very good prop. Um, but I understand what you're trying to do. Um, and I really uh, want to point out that uh, there are no uh, safe drinking water standards for pharmaceuticals and that what you're proposing to put into the aquifer is a chemical soup made in a sewage plant and uh, there are a lot of things that react and happen that cannot be tested for or even known. Regarding the continued work toward getting the plant at, s at Santa Cruz City, you've also got to consider the, the 11 miles Thank of you. brine conveyance pipeline that would be saved and those environmental contaminations that could be avoided. Thank, Thank you. you. Colonel Terry Maxwell, I agree fully with every comment of Ms. Steinbrunner's. Clearly, you should not approve this. And again, the big picture is, why would you impose a $100 million debt on 15,000 innocent, unsuspecting, hardworking water customers of the Soquel Creek Water District when you don't have to, when it's preposterously not necessary? There are water resources in this county from the rivers, from the rain, from storage, from surface water recovery, well available. There are regional approaches that, yes, would do away with the necessity for the Soquel Creek Water District to exist. Let it be merged into a state regional solution, cut its overhead costs by probably 70 percent, and focus on water delivery not accommodating developers like Swenson's who bribed and manipulated their way to get approval of so Aptos Village and other things. Not this Mr. Prakash. I still want to know whether Mr. Basso represents him also as a lawyer, <coughs> who you're going to approve 17 more hotel units and their water consumption. 
What is wrong with you? Can't you see the big picture? Can't you understand that you have an obligation to protect the resources and the interests of all 15,000 current incumbent water customers? You're not doing that. And Becky's a thousand percent correct on why would you add pharmaceutically polluted water when you don't need to on top of at a cost of a hundred million dollars. Do the right thing. Be honest with the state government. We have a polyglot group of water authorities here, all of which are burdened with staffs and overhead that overburden your customers. Turn this down. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I think staff is hard. Yeah, I, I apologize already, for not somebody, making it a motion, no, but, but I, I mean, think I it's think clear. It, I think we've made our our. our yeah. Well, it Vision says there possible clear on action. our last on our la at our last meeting. So, since this is informational only, and they pretty much we know. So what's you're directing going on. staff to continue, as it says in number two. We'll we'll go forth on just this item. Yeah. Um, because of the last meeting, uh, you said it had some delays. I think that that has already been made clear. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so let's go to item six point five, uh, professional legal services. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Cameron. Yes, item 6.5 is to approve professional services for special legal counsel to support um, assistance with the procurement of um, negotiations and construction for the future Pier Water SoCal activities. Um, where we are right now with the project evaluation and implementation is that with the approval of the project, we're going forward with uh, the preliminary design efforts and the design efforts will lead us to going out to develop and hire um, a firm that can further that design um, and the way that we're procuring that at this point for treatment and conveyance would be through a design um, build pro process. For the injection wells, we are foreseeing that we would do that with the traditional design bid build, um, but for conveyance and for the treatment, we are looking to do design build because that um, is something that we want to make sure that the procurement contracts um, are written. We are looking to ha assist um, us with some special counsel, and so the district did go out and put out an RFQ, a request for qualifications for uh, an, a, a legal firm to assist with that. Um, as documented in the agenda item and the staff report, uh, it describes the process that we went through with that, and through that process, we are presenting and proposing um, Hanson Bridget, who has demonstrated that they have recent experience with similar projects and similar procurement style. Um, the scope of services that we are including uh, for the board's consideration of approval tonight is for assistance with, um, you know, obviously getting a familiarity with uh, who we are and what our project is um, and assisting us with the development of an RFQ. Um, they also um, are, would be working with us and, and with um, uh, gen our general counsel. So if there's any questions, I'm here to answer. Questions? Bruce? Just basic questions. So it's standard to need a legal guidance on RFQ of this scope? Yes, um, we would like to have some special assistance on this because these types of contracts design and span through both um, the design and the const eventual construction of it. So um, there's different ways to structure a contract and we wanna make sure that we're identifying what's in the contract in terms of risks um, and be because there's multiple parties involved. There'd be the district as the owner and there'd be the designer and then the, the, the contractor okay. or the builder. And this uh, budget for this is coming out of the, the grant that you already have? The budget for this right now, we're asking that um, be funded through um, OCR for the remainder of the year. Um, if we are uh, successful in receiving a grant, then um, this could be coming out of that, yes. Okay, other questions? That's a great idea. I think um, the GRIP project in Southern California, they did the same thing. Okay. 
um, public comment? Yeah. <laughs> I happen to have some familiarity with such contracts and water issues and construction <laughs> projects. I f and I've read the package here. I find the need for $110,000 of the 15,000 and some rate payers of this district to be absorbed, to have to pay an addition $110,000 on top of all the money they pay Mr. Basso and his law firm and the environmental lawyer he's brought in and who knows what other consultation. And I find the numbers here preposterous. This contract matter could be written in one or three days of discussions if you needed it, which you don't because it's not really justifiable because it's an environmental nightmare. But if it had value, if the entire pure water project had any value, this could be done in three days of competent lawyer effort with presumably if you had competent technical staff. So I'd say that's about $3,000 to $6,000 maximum in legal fees that you should approve for this. And I'm aghast Mr. Basso can't bring somebody in on a day who's got extensive experience with these contracts for that period of time. This is $100,000 of waste of the SoCal Creek Water District customers' money. Plain and simple. And why don't you have the astute ability, some of you with a business experience and a experience with this, to see that? Turn this down and do not waste $100,000. And tell Mr. Basso to provide more for what he's being paid for. Don't you dare approve it. I would add this to all the other waste you've incur incurred here and the misspending and mismanagement. I think you should all be held personally accountable at some point for the waste of the ratepayers' money you have it done here by the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner. I have a question. What is OCR? Operating mean? Contingency Reserve. Ah, okay, thank you. And um, what uh, I understand that they'll help with, uh, this would help with uh, negotiating the contracts necessary for construction. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean, um, because I haven't read the contract, I'm sorry, but how thoroughly would that be involving the county public works um, for encroachment permits, things like that, uh, liability for damage to historic structures along the way where the conveyance uh, pipes are gonna be, things like that. My other question is, um, I had not seen in your agendas before that you were putting out an RFP for this kind of legal help. So what I, this leads me to wonder is, are you now putting out an RFP for the company that would do the design, build, operate, which I know is having attended your special board meetings uh, discussing how to fast track construction of this project, that you, you were very uh, much favoring a design, build, operate uh, model. Are you putting those RFPs out now? I know that Mr. Stephen Waite from IDE has been here a couple of times, and um, so they're circling. Um, so just if you can just please give me a status report on those issues, I would appreciate it very much. Thank you. No, there's no RFP out for that. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah, no. Okay. okay. I'm... Uh, I'm sitting in the audience because I have a cold and I didn't want to share it with the secretary, but uh, a couple of comments. Number one, I didn't hire the attorneys that are representing you for in the CEQA action. Best, Best and Krieger are specialists in CEQA and they've been on board since uh, more than a year ago and it's not somebody that I hired. Number two, um, as to Mr. Patel, I don't know anything about Mr. Patel's matter until it shows up on the agenda. But I, while I'm sitting here, I looked, and it appears that uh, Patel, by the way, is the Indian name commonly associated with, with uh, lodging. You'll, if you go to look at the things, you'll find that most of the motels 
and hotels in Santa Cruz are owned by somebody named Patel, not always a first. <coughs> but in the past, I have represented a Mr. Patel in a matter in Santa Cruz, but I had nothing to do with this particular thing. I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about the project. I don't even know if it's the same Mr. Patel. Um, so let's put that one at rest. Um, and finally, Judge Gallagher went to great lengths to explain to uh, Ms. Steinbrenner that he had not had anything to do with me or my firm directly for the last almost 10 years. He ran for election in 2010, um, and he had taken a sabbatical shortly before that. I've appeared before Judge Gallagher all the time. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Judge Gallagher is a very fair judge. He looks at the facts and addresses them. And I hate to see some, hearing somebody condemn somebody like Judge Gallagher who does his best to be as fair as he can be. Thank you. Okay, so um, back to our item now. Um, any motions or I would to approve. it was moved by director I moved to approve <laughs> I, I all three, there's, oh. three there's three motions there's three motions mm -hmm. yeah. I just got so excited <laughs> <laughs> I came off my they're all parked to, they're all together yes I move to approve all three. I think this is a great idea. I'll second that. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now we go to item 6.6. .6. This is the uh, uh, AMI. Yeah, so this is a request to authorize the general manager to execute uh, agreements related to our upgrade from advanced meter uh, reading drive-by AMR to advanced metering infrastructure or AMI and so um, just a little bit of background um, we currently uh, are using a drive-by AMR and collecting monthly meter reads um, our system right now consists of water meters electronic registers that send the signal to the receivers in our trucks and um, then the receivers themselves so um, that's how we currently run our system. Um, the electronic register component of that metering system is reaching the end of its life cycle, and we're seeing a lot of um, those units fail to send a signal to the receiver in the truck. We are, so we're having to manually read those meters, and that's significantly impacting our staffing levels. Um, right now, we have about 2,200 failed registers, and so it's pretty critical that we um, we take action and the board's directed us to upgrade to AMI based on the earlier leak notification qualities and um, it's estimated that that alone can save 86 acre feet of water per year. And so that's, um, uh, the project itself is being funded through our water demand offset program due to that, that water saving capability. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, we have three agreements here tonight. Two of them are with Master Meter, who's the manufacturer of our current system and also the manufacturer of the AMI equipment. Um, those two agreements, um, one is for software, it's called Harmony, and the other is for um, the fixed network infrastructure equipment, uh, the purchase of that and the installation of that. Um, those are base stations and repeaters or antennas that relay the, um, pick up the signals from the meters and then re relay them to a computer. And basically the district can then access that data and share it with customers. Um, so, and then the, the second agreement with Master Meter also is for long-term maintenance of that AMI fixed network equipment, which um, that maintenance uh, would begin about a year after all of that equipment is installed. So um, those agreements are have been negotiated and I think um, we arrived in a pretty good place through those negotiations. We recognized some cost savings and reduced the risk to the district. 
um, and also inserted a lot of clarity into some of the manufacturer's documents. So I think um, those came a long way and they're final and ready to um, be executed at this point. Um, they did go through BBK, um, legal counsel helped us with those and then Mr. Basso helped in the negotiations and the final agreement. So um, those two are, are I think in final shape. And then the third is an agreement with Master Meters Authorized Distributor for meters and registers. And that's with Corin Main LP. Um, that agreement we didn't quite get finalized by the time the packet was due. And so we're asking for that one um, to continue negotiations and then execute um, agreement, um, have the general manager execute the agreement once our legal counsel's comfortable with that. Since then, we did get the feedback from Core and Maine, and I've been through that with Mr. Basso, and um, we don't see anything significant in their proposed changes, and so he's comfortable with uh, accepting that as is. So uh, that's just uh, a little bit of background there. Um, yeah, so um, requesting execute the uh, agreements and then execute or authorize us to go ahead and sign purchase orders so we can get this project off the ground, um, starting with installing the first base station and repeater and then ordering the, the registers and the, um, the meters that we're gonna need for the project. So that's it, okay. any questions? Sure. Bruce? Um, as you mentioned, we're implicitly approving purchase orders tonight, though we won't actually see them ourselves. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering where the money's gonna come from to pay these purchase orders, since as you've mentioned, we're not gonna see any of these things for a couple of years. And most all the things we've seen have been like the 10% deposits. No one's been paying much of the full amount. So how are we gonna get the money to do these purchase orders? We have about a... Um I think it's about a million dollars right now in offset fees, which is enough to get us started. And so we're hoping that that's going to uh, get us pretty far down the road and that in a year or so we're going to be seeing some more offset fees come in through especially some of the older projects that are still on the books that should be pretty far along. Um, we may find that we do have some funding limitations down the road and we're just going to have to deal with them at that time, um, possibly um, like we've done in the past where the district does pay for things and then we re refund ourselves once those offset fees come in. Okay. But I, I was looking at one of the contracts and I think the first one or something is like, was it $12 million or something? So. No. Um, which contract are you talking about? I don't know which one. I looked at one of them. I, I don't remember which one. So as far as the costs go, um, the software costs are, are pretty insignificant up front. There's a $2,400 training cost. There's a $3,500. Um, yeah, you want to go to uh, the attachment um, one. 94. I'm looking at exhibit B, page 194, and there's a... Okay. No, those are thousands. I can't see page numbers. Oh, 190. So uh, the software training is $2,400. It's a one-time fee. Um, the mobile um, software license is $3,500 per year. Um, and uh, we'll probably still be paying that for the next fiscal year. And then once we um, have the training and get the first base station and repeater in, then we'll switch over to their um, alternate software charges, which are based on per endpoint, but we're not likely to trigger any significant charges for the first year um, because we're not gonna have that many endpoints installed. Um, when they are fully installed, that'll be about $20,000 per year in software costs. Um, for the fixed network equipment, that's $160,000 and that's a one-time charge for the equipment and the installation. And then the maintenance um, charges, um, once everything's all installed and has been in place for a year, will be $23,000 a year. And then the cost for the registers and the meters themselves um, is a little bit harder to nail down at this point. 
um, but it's looking like that's going to run us about $2 million when it's all said and done. And that's for, for all customers? Yes, for the, that's for all customers, and it includes larger whole meter replacements. So all of our meters over one and, a, one and a half inches and up, so one and a half, two inch, three inch, four, six, and then we have some eights that we've already done. We're replacing the meters as well because those have reached or are near reaching their uh, warranty thresholds. They have, they're different than the smaller meters. So we're doing full meter replacements, but that makes up about 98% of our total meter population. So all of the smaller things are register only. And I, I believe that with it is with about a 40% discount. Yes. And you had a question or is that you got Well, just, I remember when this was brought to the board months, several months ago, or perhaps even a half a year ago, there was some concerns about the reliability of what we're replacing it with. Has there been a new information on, on that? I think that was uh, basically a misrepresentation misrepre of what happened in the city of San Diego. And um, it wasn't that the meters themselves were faulty. It was that the installer and the meter readers were um, uh, producing errors and that fed into the billing system. And so I, I think that the meter programming um, didn't get carried over properly into the billing system and that resulted in errors. So it wasn't the, that the meters were misreading or that the equipment was bad, it was human error and also the uh, failure to change that in the billing system. Okay, I have a question. So since some of the other We've had problems with some of the other registers, uh, meters and, well, the registers, I guess. Um, did they give any kind of a guarantee? I didn't find that in there. For the, the, um, how long are they We have a warranty. For? For, we will have a warranty for the registers. It's basically the same as the AMR um, system. So the What's the time period? It's 10 years for the register component, and the meter bodies themselves are um, 20 years. Okay. Um, so we're, for most of our meter bodies, we're 10 years into that warranty and we still have another 10 years. So okay. Okay. in another 10 years, we'll probably be back to the drawing board and looking at a full upgrade and, you know, technology will probably be yeah. even different than it is now, so. Okay. Um, any public comment on this item? Seeing none. Um, I'll move approval of all three motions. I'll second. Which include, I did. I, I Sorry, I said any public comment and I didn't see anybody coming up. So go ahead. I did say that. I had you had your head down, I guess. Me a question. Thank you. Thank you for accommodating me. I didn't hear you. Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I want to protest this. I'm not one of your customers, but I do uh, travel through your district's area. And I want to protest uh, an added layer of um, electromagnetic frequency. Um, I want to know what your opt-out policy will be. Um, just to make clear, this is going to decrease the amount of, uh, there's uh, the meters are already um, radio read meters, and, and so this is going to actually decrease the transmission time by significantly. But you're talking about now installing transmitters and repeaters and antenna. That is an escalation in your uh, EMF uh, okay. footprint so over a neighborhood. So I would like to know what your opt-out policy will be. All utilities are required to offer an opt-out policy for smart meters. And that's what these are, these are smart meters. So um, I'd like clarification and discussion on that. I see that um, the antennas are um, on your diagram, at least in the what's on tap, show that they'll be on your water tanks. Is that uh, an going to be an exclusive location for your antennas? Or is this just for um, a model design? Uh, there are some areas where you may not have tanks that would need coverage. 
I would also caution you a bit and sitting, having sat in on a Santa Cruz City um, capital improvement project discussion, they were discussing having to refinish some of their tanks. And they did make note that in a tank that had an antenna on top that the level of uh, degradation in the tank was much worse than they had anticipated. My um, question to you is to consider if there could be mild electrolysis that happens when you put an antenna on top of a metal tank. Um, I do want to make it clear that um, the American Disabilities Act does recognize EMF-sensitive people as a recognized um, disability, and so you must um, provide an opt-out um, ability for people like that, and you must make it clear to people who will be living and working in these areas of new uh, technology that you're putting in, new elements of it that what they are and what power level they're working on. What, what are the power levels that these signals would be generated out into the, um, the air? Thank you very much. Oh, I want to say this does not fit your water demand offset policy. They're supposed to have a 20-year life. They would not have been done otherwise, and you have budgeted money for Thank smart you. meters. Thank you. And the results must be measurable. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll prompt it, especially when I have Ms. Steinbrenner's astute comments. Yes, you're not complying with your water demand offset policy, as she described. Another, another contradiction, uh, another disappointment, and another dishonesty, perhaps, by the board of directors here uh, and your st senior staff. Uh, in addition, the electromagnetic uh, pollution is bad. In fact, the studies on which you relied putting this in, I read with Mr. Duncan's office some years ago, were miscited um, and contradictory. If you pull those, you'll see that some of which they said, oh, there'll be no problem, it was contradictory. They're based on the Stewart Report in Britain. A another long extended example of the Soquel Creek Water Department Board and its staff not being honest with the technical and engineering facts and the water resources facts and reality in balancing the concerns of your customers, the rate payers, who are your product, who are your customers, who in effect own this place. And I think they should be ready to have it merged with a regional water management authority, probably at the state level in Sacramento or the U.S. Department of Interior, and do away with all of this waste, all of this mismanagement, all of these opportunities for corruption, influencing Apparently, this board in prior years approving the Aptos Village, this board approving other things, this board caving into developers, this board negligently failing to address the water depletion of the aqua for decades, as well as recent years. And this board not being honest with recognizing there are adequate surface water resources, there are adequate rain resources, the locker for alternatives available, and instead you want to inflict another hundred million dollars in debt on F just 15,000 customers when this could all be avoided by the consolidations I've made reference to. Fox Sloan, Soquel Hills. Yeah, I'm really glad I came tonight. As a child and family rights advocate, I can see that there are real issues with the Soquel Creek Water District. Not only the water that will be poisoning children, but now with these smart meters. I hope you've done your research that's been done here in the United States, Canada, and Europe on these devices and what damage they are causing to children. I will be bringing this issue up with our uh, national organizations that protect children and families. So you're impacting them, the families negatively with a raise in uh, rates. That's a financial ding. Um, the children are at risk for being poisoned, and now they're at risk from these EMFs. So this is totally unacceptable to children and families. I hope you realize that. And I'm going to take it higher, because this is, is a real issue. And as a parent and a grandparent, let me tell you, we are mad as hell, and we're not taking this treatment anymore. And, and when it comes to 
you talk about uh, parts per million. When I look at it as parts of corruption, you guys are really dense, really dense. Well, that's uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, we'll move on to the item. It just, yeah. <laughs> can I say, um, <coughs> we disagree on some things. Um, I will just make a point. We do have an opt-out policy that's been in place for a while and um, that the research, is it, the actual research on electromagnetic radiation is very clear. So I'll m we'll move on. I made a motion for all three of the motions. I don't know if anybody had a chance to second. I did. Okay. It's moved, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. We will move on <coughs> to the... Yes, the revision of the collection policy. Page 260. So item 6.7 on the agenda tonight um, addresses Senate Bill 998, which was uh, passed into law on September 2018. And for water agencies our size, we will have to comply by February of 2020, which is less than a year from now. So um, this particular policy is taking what um, we currently have on the books in terms of administrative order number two um, for delinquent accounts and then another procedure number three for our after hours turn on and combining them into a single collection policy. And that policy is drafted to um, incorporate the mandates of SB 998. I won't list them all for you. They're there in the memo for you to review. But basically um, what that um, Senate bill is asking us to do is asking us to give an extended time frame for our collection process. So rather than being able to shut a customer off for non-payment after 45 days, we now have to wait until they're 60 days delinquent, which means we're gonna be probably closer to the 82 day mark before we can actually shut a, a service off for non-payment. <clears throat> this means they're likely to have two or three bills on file at that point. So it's increasing the district's exposure to um, bad debt or uncollectible accounts. So when we reviewed this, we took a look at that timeline process. We realized that there were gonna need to be some administrative and billing changes as a result, um, that we would need to make some slight modifications to our, the format of our bill. And since we are now in the process of configuring our new software to go live in May, it just seemed to make sense to go ahead and leverage that and make all of these changes at the same time rather than having to go back and hire consultants to assist us in that process at a later date. So we're proposing that these be enacted effective May 1st. Um, they will appear in the new billing system then. Um, we're also actually proposing some changes to the fee structure. We used to assess a $25 delinquent fee when we were ready to shut a customer off for non-payment. And that fee was to cover the costs that's, that were incurred by staff to follow that collection process through to that 45 day mark and to send trucks out and staff out to a, a residence and actually shut off the service. Under this new policy, um, that's not gonna be happening over, an, that won't be happening until 82 days out. So we're proposing a delinquent fee instead at the 21 day mark that would be reduced in scope from $25 to $10. And that $10 is just to cover the cost of the notification process and the collection process. And it doesn't involve having to send staff out to their premises anymore. So we think we can start with a much lower fee um, for delinquency. <coughs> the service reestablishment fee that the district has always <coughs> charged to reestablish re service after a cutoff was $40. SB 998 sets a threshold um, a maximum threshold of $50 for low-income families, and that would be low-income families whose household, um, household for a household of four was 200% of the federal poverty level. So rather than exceed that $50 threshold and incur additional administrative costs to try and isolate which families meet the low-income threshold, it makes sense just to keep that at the $50 threshold and not exceed that. So we're proposing we move the service reestablishment fee from the existing $40 to $50, keep it under the threshold, but allow for the extended um, costs that we're gonna face with the extended collection timeline. Then the other proposal is to look at the service reestablishment fee. 
and that fee is uh, after hours fee is sixty dollars. So if we reestablish service after five p.m. on weeknights, over the weekends or on holidays, we're actually having to pay staff overtime and on call time to come out and turn those services on after hours. So we reevaluated the cost of that. There is a threshold that they've set under SB 998 of one hundred and fifty dollars for low-income families, and again, we're recommending that we keep ourselves below that mark so we don't need to try and track those families in our district. Um, so $100 is sufficient to cover the actual costs, we believe, at this point, of sending somebody out and that collection process to get us there, the costs of insurance and fuel and um, the cost of the vehicles. So we think we can cover that with $100, but we can go anywhere from 100 to 150 um, 150 would be more of a, t a deterrent um, mechanism, where 100 is a cost recovery mechanism. So we're actually um, asking the board to kind of give us your recommendation tonight on where you'd like to set that after hours um, reestablishment fee. And we took a look at how the district would compare to other agencies in the area, and we're actually um, pretty conservative in what we're applying. I have a hunch once SB 998 goes into effect, these other agencies throughout the district or throughout the county will probably be changing their fee structure as well. Um, but tonight, our uh, possible our board actions would be to go ahead and approve the um, amendments to administrative order number two and procedure number three and combine them under the collection policy. And then to um, give us some guidance on where you would like that after hours reestablishment charge set and then approve the revised fee schedule that would be revised to include your recommendation on the after hours fee. Thank you. Okay. Questions from the board? Very clear. No questions. No, that was very clear. Um, any comments from the public on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinberger. I want to thank you for doing your best to keep costs down. For your customers, I, I talk with a lot of them at the farmer's market, and I know a lot of them are already struggling. And with the increases that your board has improved has approved tonight, it's going to make it very difficult for a lot of them. So um, some of them um, had leaks and didn't know it and had their water turned off, not because of uh, delinquent fees, but um, it's, it's a tough thing when those the water gets shut off and I really appreciate you doing your best to keep the cost down and um, appreciate that you're doing cost recovery and not deterrent no no penalizing thank you thank you yeah I, I personally am fine with cost recovery me too, me too. I'll make the motions with the hundred dollars and seven hundred fifty all three, two, all three motions. All three motions. All three motions, but uh, number two be hundred dollars. Okay, and I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. And so now we will go to item six point eight, which is uh, it's not too controversial, I don't think. Um, the groundwater awareness no. week and um, fix a leak week. Back to back. Yes, that's just to recognize that in this month we have two nationally recognized weeks. Um, the Groundwater Awareness Week and the Fix a Leak Week are one ones that we've traditionally highlighted in the past. Uh, this year we are going to be broadcasting that through our traditional um, outreach materials. And um, what our outreach and communications team would like to do is obviously make this a, a you know a year-round type of um, outreach and promotion. So we will be tying even more of the um, groundwater awareness um, throughout the year. Any questions? No. Any comment from public? Seeing none, um, what's your pleasure? It's a roll call vote. It's a roll call vote. Moved, second. Moved by um, Carla. Carla and Bruce got a second, okay. Director Lather? Yes. Vice President Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President LeHue? Yes, ma'am. Um, and now um, item 6.9 is um, it's a little more surplus property. 
Yeah, since you approved some uh, equipment and vehicles as surplus last board meeting, we identified um, three desktop scanners um, as surplus candidates. So we'd like to add that to the, the surplus sale that we're planning on having later this month. Questions, no. Okay, public comment, no. All right, I'll move approval. I'll second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Is a roll call? Yes. Yes. Roll oh, this call. one's roll call too. Sorry, my bad. Director Lather? Then yes. Right. Vice yeah. President Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Lahue? Yes. Um, last item on uh, the agenda is written communications. Any comments, questions? Nope. Public comment? This is, this is about the written communication. Yes, I've read Mr. McGuire's emails to you, uh, and I concur entirely in it. I won't restate the contents, but she's totally correct, and she's totally correct and accurate in her criticisms of you, which you should correct and direct your staff to fix and mitigate. Failure to do so is continued disregard of your sworn duties. Okay, so we are going to adjourn to a closed session. Um, three closed sessions. There's three different items on the closed session. If anybody has comments before that, this is the time. Thank you. I do have comment um, on item 8.1, your um, acquisition lease interest in real property located at 2505 Chanticleer Avenue. This is the site for um, the Pure Water SoCal Advanced Water Treatment Facility. And again, I do not think you should proceed with this because uh, the whole project is under litigation and there has been um, some hesitation by Director Lather saying she's not real happy about this. I. Um, <laughs> it's not in your district. And the people you you had on, on February, I forget the date exactly, <laughs> but you had a room full of people here from Live Oak who had no idea this was coming to their neighborhood and that's one of the CEQA violations that I allege in the lawsuit that you did not, um, you changed the scope of the project but you did not expand your um, scope of public notification and that's a violation. So you need to stop with this and you need to um, back up and pause and and correct this. And I know that you have, I've heard that you have had some meetings with uh, some of the Live Oak people and I did submit a Public Records Act request for, I think you said you had 30 meetings or something and I've not had time to look at that information but um, I think you need to pause here and uh, not pursue at this time acquisition and lease interest in the property. And again, urge you if you do, to do some due diligence about that well that is visible and historic use and soil contamination. And you're laughing, you're, you're smiling while I'm trying to give my comment and that doesn't make me feel like I'm being taken very seriously, I'm sorry. It's a bit disrespectful. A mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, my my last comment has to do with 8.3 um, regarding a litigation that I have against the district case 19CV00181. And I urge you to, to do take it seriously. I do intend to pursue it with vigor. And I was disappointed by the, um, dis by the um, ex parte judge con Judge Gallagher's decision today to deny it, but um, I, d I do plan to pursue it vig with vigor and hope that you will honor the CEQA process and what it is supposed to allow the public to do and what you are as a public agency uh, required to do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Just a follow-on comment to uh, Ms. Steinbrenner's comment on point. 
Uh, I observed the proceeding, I read the paperwork, and Judge Gallagher made a decision that was contrary to the California Environmental Quality Law, contrary to Brown Act and other items, contrary to the facts, and contract to the, contrary to the law in general, and extremely suspicious, and he should have properly recused himself. Mr. Basso should have asked him to do so. Again, it's an example, of, again, the fixing that goes on in this county that favors the rich, that favors business, that favors the Swensons, that favors others, and disregards the interest of the citizens, the school children, and the taxpayers, and the rate payers to the Soquel Creek Water Board. Why do, are you so complicit so often on the people who are stealing from your customers? Water resources and money. We are now going to go into a closed session, and I will say, for one, I am very proud to work with this board of directors who's been working for years to try and do the right thing. There are always going to be people that disagree, and I'm sorry that you disagree, but we are all trying to do our best, and I, I am going to say good night. Tonight we're going to closed session. This meeting is adjourned. Will there be anything reportable? We will report out. I haven't had the closed session yet. <laughs>